Dunstani. I'm live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. This is Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. And here are three things that you need to know this morning. Expecting a hawkish hold, the Fed is widely expected to hold steady on rates at today's meeting. But the focus is going to be on those quarterly rate projections known as a dot plot. The big question, are we still on course for one more quarter point hike this year? Last week, the ECB surprised many with its move, so investors will be on high alert, especially with oil hitting 10-month highs. And good things come in threes, apparently. Could Clavio be the surprise winner from last week's IPO boom? Instacart's down in pre-market after popping on its debut on Tuesday, and then chip designer Arm facing downside pressure again. Clavio is the lesser known of the three, but the marketing and data automation provider looks to have lured some big cornerstone investors, as has priced its listing above the marketed range to raise $576 million. And paralysis is the word for the House GOP as leaders abandon a vote to avert a shutdown at the end of the month amid opposition from a conservative bloc. No, it means that the risk of a U.S. government shutdown rears its head again. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is trying to unite Republicans in his chamber to pass a funding bill. Now, despite knowing it's all but unlikely to die in the Senate, the legislation aiming to avoid a government shutdown by extending funding, funding through the end of October. Well, Today's backdrop, we've got another IPO from Clavio today. That's along with a looming government shutdown. All of this is as the Federal Reserve prepares to make their latest decision on interest rates here. And, of course, as we kind of kick off and start things off here on the show today, of course, all the focus is going to be on this afternoon, the Fed announcement and the press conference, the tone, the tenor that Fed Chair Jay Powell strikes. But perhaps we focus in, at least for a hot second here as well, on the IPO environment here, because one huge thing that's going to be continuously watched is the not just first day pop that we did see in the shares of Arm, the shares of as well uh, Instacart, but then ultimately how from their point, from that point forward, uh, we continue to see some of this trading moderation as we have seen some slippage uh, in early trading days for both of those names too. Yeah, when it comes to Clavio, what we could see here, there's a lot going into this IPO specifically because many on the street are saying that maybe this is the best gauge of the three just in terms of whether or not we're going to see even more IPO activity down the line. Now, this is the second VC-backed company, obviously following Instacart yesterday, that is going public today. But when it comes, there's an important distinction to make here, Brad, and that's the valuation that these two companies have attracted. So, a Clavio priced at 30 bucks a share last night, giving it a market value of just over $9 billion, $9.2 billion at that IPO price. That's not a huge difference. It's actually essentially in line for where the company was valued in the private market going back to 2021. So that's a massive distinction when you compare it to Instacart and the huge reduction, huge hit that we saw in valuation for Instacart yesterday. The interesting thing here, too, is that for a lot of investors out there that are looking for more of a B2B type of enterprise software mm -hmm. company, they got it with Clavio, but the larger question is the market uh, place and the portfolio client base that they can t continue to sell investors that they're going to be able to attract in some of those net new customers and larger purchases or contracts here. Uh, what's particularly noticeable here about the environment that they're entering into, at least the competitive landscape, this in marketing automation has already seen some of the major acquisitions in the form of Oracle acquiring Eloqua or even um, some of the larger plays that we had seen and even Marketo trying to make it into the public markets as well. And so all of these things considered, uh, you've already got Oracle, Adobe, some of those larger marketing automation plays out there. Just a larger question of where uh, Clavio, for their own right, can continue to sell investors that they're going to be able to grow out that larger client base going forward from here. Yeah, certainly. They're up against some stiff competition. Many of their competitors are much larger than they are, so they could be at a disadvantage here, at least in the short term. And when you come to that, take a look at some of these numbers, one, it's a profitable company. They turned profitable during the first half of the year. And also revenue was up 64 percent from a year ago, just shy of $250 million. So, Brad, we're going to be covering this all day today waiting for that first trade. And later on this afternoon, I will be speaking with the CEO of Clavio. You see him right there on your screen, Andrew Bialecki. He is going to be joining Yahoo Finance later on this afternoon. We'll air that in our 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time show. Let's talk about today's big market driver, and that is Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve. Now, traders are expecting the Fed to hold interest rates steady. 
The meeting following a spike in energy prices, which could complicate the Fed's inflation battle. Now, Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schomberger has those details for us. Jen. Good morning, Shauna. Fed officials just reconvening for the second day of their policy meeting here in Washington, where, as you said, they are widely expected to hold interest rates steady, though many economists expect officials to pencil in one more rate hike for the rest of this year. But while many expect just one more rate hike this year, the bigger question may be how long the Fed will stay on hold at elevated levels. Will officials still see 100 basis points of rate cuts next year, or will we see fewer rate cuts projected implying higher for longer? Fed Chair Jerome Powell is likely to note up front that the job is not done on inflation and that the Fed will stay the course in order to get inflation back to 2 percent. Powell likely to reiterate his message from Jackson Hole that the Fed is in a position to, quote, proceed carefully as it mulls future actions, while also leaving rate hikes squarely on the table. Recall in Jackson Hole, Fed Chair Powell said that although inflation has moved down from its peak, it remains too high and that the Fed is prepared to raise rates further if appropriate and intends to hold policy at a restrictive level until they're confident inflation is coming back down to the Fed's 2 percent target. Now, this afternoon, we will get new projections on the outlook for inflation and the economy. Many economists expect the Fed to lower their outlook for inflation, given the recent cooling inflation data we have gotten. And they expect the GDP outlook will be raised, given just how resilient this economy has been. This decision coming down at 2 p.m. Eastern, followed by Fed chair's press conference at 2.30. Guys. All right. Thanks so much, Jen. We're going to be tracking that closely, as we know you will as well here. You know, just to hearken for a beat on this a little bit more, we were having conversations throughout the week, Shauna, with economists on our show, some global market strategists as well. One of them that stuck out to me uh, was our conversation with uh, Christina Cooper earlier this week, global chief global market strategist for Invesco. And one of the things that she had kind of looked back at previously and historically and pointed to to say that this meeting would be a little bit more than a nothing burger, but at the end of the day, it would have come down to two data points similar to what we had seen in June of last year, where the Fed had communicated in advance of the meeting that they anticipated hiking rates 50 basis points, but then got two data points just days before that led it to hike 75 basis points. Well, in the absence of those two big data points that um, we've been tracking over the course of these past two weeks and few weeks, the Fed hasn't gotten those. So at this point, now, what really takes up a lot of the conversation, what takes up the airspace within that meeting is going to be the larger question. I think that's where we can get a little bit more insight to how the Fed is thinking about November once we hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell at 2.30. Yeah, exactly. That dot plot, that is really going to be in focus here for the markets. And I think that is essentially what is actually going to dictate the moves that we'll likely yeah. see here this afternoon. When we talk about the fact that the Fed has been projecting two more rate hikes initially in June before the end of the year, we've gotten one. So that means one more left either today or November or December, unless obviously if they do change their projections there. So any update on that really has a potential to move the markets this afternoon. And when it comes to the Fed fund futures right now, what traders are pricing in 99 percent expecting a hold today, 70 percent expecting a hold in November and 59 percent still expecting the Fed to hold in December. I was a little bit surprised about that December number, given the massive mm. jump that we've seen in energy prices. So any insight into how Powell and the Fed is thinking about the recent spike that we've seen in energy and how that could potentially complicate their battle to get inflation under control, I think is really going to be critical. Yeah, and those might just be some some placeholder probabilities, at least until the decision yep. comes out today, which would change the calculus for everything at those coming meetings as well in November and December. Well, oil prices have been rising since the summer amid a supply crunch. Now, historically speaking, surging energy costs have played a role in tipping the U.S. into a recession, and oil's upward price movement isn't making the Federal Reserve's path towards a 2% inflation target any easier. Let's bring in Katie Kaminsky, Alpha Simplex Chief Research Strategist and Portfolio Manager to weigh in. Hey, Katie, great to speak with you this morning. You know, even as we're thinking about 
how the Fed is going to be discussing oil and how, once again, uh, perhaps it's coming to light for a lot of people out there that it's it's not the Fed that is driving all matters of inflation, but certainly is watching some of the other inputs that are out of their control. You know, how much of the conversation do you believe that this really takes up at their meeting uh, that commenced yesterday and will conclude today? Yes, I think the thing that's been very interesting to watch with oil is that in the Jackson Hole meeting, Powell focused on upside risks. He said upside risks to inflation are what we have to watch out for. And why oil is so important is this is a particular pressure point for the economy. It's a pressure point for consumers. It's a pressure point for pass-through effects that can cause a ripple effect in inflation. And that's why everyone is focused on it is because we could have further upside risks to inflation, which would further complicate the ability to get down to target. And if that's the case, that means we're going to be higher for longer. And what we've actually seen is that has had an impact on the market as well. We've seen a steepener in the curve. We've seen more flat yield curve. We've seen bonds selling off. We've seen investors nervous about inflation. Um, And that's why today is so important to see how the Fed actually reacts to that recent data. Katie, what is in your base case just in terms of what has already been priced into the market when it comes to this risk? And really, what's going to be the driver here this afternoon if we do hear any update from the Fed? Well, given that they focus on upside risk last time, I think it's really going to be important to focus on to see what they comment on that and how they focus on their long-term expectations. But I think something that's really hard with long-term estimates for economic forecasts is that they're really difficult to forecast. And so those pictures are going to take more time. Our general view is that rates are going to be higher for longer, and it's going to take a lot more time for us to sort out this economic economic situation in a post-COVID and also a post, um, in post-peak inflation world um, where we're going to actually have to soar through for a lot longer than people I think would like. Okay. All right. Well, that, that doesn't sound great for some of us who want to get homes, things of that nature. I don't know. Shelter seems pretty important out here. But at the end of the day, that's something that the Fed also discusses. We know that, you know, even though that there is some jest that we might insert into the conversation, at the end of the day, this is very real. Uh, longer term ramifications. How, how do you believe the Fed is assessing what that longer term economic impact could look like? Should we be at a higher for longer for an extended period of time and perhaps not even see a cut as some uh, have been calling for as early as first quarter next year. Well, this is a really good point because I think the challenge that most investors have is that we're so used to a low interest rate environment that we've kind of forgotten that higher interest rates or at least moderate interest rates are pretty normal for most periods of history. And I think what is more abnormal to me is having an inverted yield curve. So having long-term rates that are much lower than shorter-term rates. And so I think for us that are on more of the trading side, it's really trying to figure out at what point do we see a more normal yield curve so that the 10-year and the two-year make more sense. And so I think that's where I think investors need to start thinking about what does borrowing mean from different time horizons over the next few months and really decide at what point is a yield of 6% or 5% a great investment for them and that give us enough uh, return on their investment to offset, for example, the cost of those mortgage, mortgage costs and find that equilibrium where they can actually have um, a, a good balance in their portfolio. Katie, when it comes to some of the activity that we've seen over the last week with these public debuts from Arm, from Instacart yesterday, from Clavio expected today, is that how much relief is that giving the market? Well, I mean, I think the key is that economic activity is still very positive. Um, What's been really impressive this year is despite the fact that this has been a challenging month this month and last month, you're still seeing a lot of positive mixed uh, data. And so this shows how resilient the economy is, despite a lot of the challenges that we've faced this year. I think very few of us would have ever expected that we haven't hit a recession by this point and that we could navigate uh, such a challenging uh, higher rate environment this well. And this, in some sense, is a positive sign that you know we are actually um, might find that soft landing that we're hoping for, at least that the Fed is hoping for. Katie, what's the top trade that someone can consider going into, even if this is, uh, as some have called it, and myself included, admittedly, a nothing burger meeting for the Fed? 
What could it look like going into November if someone was to consider uh, a way to maybe not all out rebalance their portfolio, but consider at least one other trade that could uh, net them some gains? I think it's important to focus on there's nice yield in shorter term treasuries right now that you can actually obtain in the short run. Um, but there are going to be some winners in this particular situation. So in terms of sectors, um, those sectors that are more resilient to duration exposure are going to be some of the winners out there. Um, you're also going to see things that do well um, in an environment where um, you know you can actually handle some of the disruption of, of a higher rates for longer. Um, so maybe, for example, in borrowing terms or mortgage companies that can actually be resilient. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting to sort through that, but there are going to be opportunities out there. We've seen dispersion across the globe, so trades like the peso versus the yen, and also sectors um, across the globe as well. There's been a lot of divergence, so there are going to be winners and losers in a, in a higher inflation environment. All right, Katie Kaminsky, Alpha Simplex, a Chief Research Strategist and Portfolio Manager. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Well, House Republicans have canceled a vote crucial to preventing a government shutdown. With less than one working week until October 1st deadline, GOP House leadership failed to sway far-right members and secure enough votes to pass their latest stopgap measure, raising the risk of a shutdown. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman, of course, has been tracking everything coming out of D.C. And, Rick, it doesn't look good at this point. Uh, we've entered the farcical phase of these negotiations to keep the government running after the uh, fiscal year ends on September 30th. Um, it, it's too boring and ridiculous to get into what's exactly happening here with the Republicans. I mean, the, the basic story is one we ought to be familiar with by now. There are about 15 or 20 uh, super hardcore uh, extreme right Republicans who are saying they're simply not going to uh, vote for funding the government unless they get large spending cuts, which uh, the Senate is never going to approve. The Senate is run by uh, Democrats, not by Republicans. And you've got even some Republicans are saying this is a clown show. So uh, I, I think uh, ordinary people can just stick their fingers in their ears and stop paying attention to this. We'll let you know when it's over and the government is back opening. And as we have been discussing uh, on air here at Yahoo Finance. This is not really a market moving event. We've been through this before. We know what happens. This is nothing like uh, the negotiations back in uh, June and May and June over whether the United States should keep paying uh, the bills that it, uh, the, the money that it owes on treasury security. So we are probably gonna get to a shutdown. Um, we're talking about um, 15 members of Congress out of 535 that are gonna be able to make this happen. Uh, and then once the shutdown happens, then we can see uh, how rep how Republicans play it, because they will most likely get the blame for it, as they have in the past. And maybe it's going to take a shutdown for them to actually get serious about figuring out how to run the government. I mean, we're, and, and, and Rick, at the same time, we're talking about thirty three trillion dollars in, in national debt. I mean, what, what have the conversations inside the Beltway sounded like as as you've continued to track them? Yeah, we just hit that new threshold. So we went from uh, total national debt in the $32 trillion range. It tipped over the $33, $33 trillion threshold. Um, I mean, this is another reason that this is kind of ridiculous, what's, what the Republicans are doing in Congress. Uh, the main reason we have $33 trillion in debt, and it's only going to get dramatically worse, um, it's all the programs that nobody is willing to do anything about. It's Medicare. It's Social Security. It's Medicaid. And also, uh, I mean, we spend a ton of money on defense. And that's where the money is. Those four things right there are about 50 percent of all funding. And that's not what um, Republicans are talking about cutting. They're talking about cutting like five cents from the IRS budget. The IRS does tax enforcement. They want to cut, um, you know, a buck here, a buck there from the Securities and Exchange Commission, from regulatory agencies. Even if, even if they were able to get all the spending cuts they want, it would make no difference in the trajectory of the federal debt. So they're they're not talking about the serious issues that really do exist. They're just talking about how to make some kind of point about the power they have to shut down the government. So I'm afraid they they are going to probably be able to shut down the government. This small coterie of radical Republicans. 
Um, and then maybe we'll get serious about figuring out, figuring out a way out of it. All right, Rick, thanks for continuing to track this. So only one of us gets a headache uh, on a daily basis. We appreciate it. Uh, you all your markets action, see you, Rick. All your markets action straight ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. Make, make sense out of what's happening in China for us. And are we getting any more clarity that we need on the markets front? So China is stimulating its economy. A lot of people think they're not, but they clearly are doing it. But it takes time, and I think that China is not in the policy that we did, like a big reopening and trying to stimulate it through free checks and say, let's go and spend a lot of money. Chinese consumers are different. They're also very cautious because what happened during extensive lockdowns, they're wary. But there is some change, and I think that this is about China being very gradual in its approach, knowing it can reach its goal for 5.5% goal uh, growth. It may not happen this year, however, it may be something for next year. I'm Shauna Smith with Brad Smith and Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery at the NASDAQ here in Times Square in New York City. We're just about six minutes until the opening bell. Jared Blickery has a closer look at some of the moves that we're seeing ahead of that, Jared. Yes, thank you, Team Smith here. We're looking at some of the futures in the U.S. represented, and we can see all are about one-third of a percent. Russell 2000 up a little bit more. Let me show you what pre-FOMC drift looks like. This is when you get that gradual rise overnight right into that Fed meeting. This is what used to happen back in the day. We'd see lower volatility, and then we get some fireworks around 2 
2.30 p.m. That's when uh, Powell is going to take the uh, chair, or <laughs> Chair Powell is going to take the lectern, the podium today. And let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100, see what's moving here. More green than red. The background color is what happened yesterday. Those little boxes of what's happening in the after hours. We're seeing Apple down just slightly, Microsoft up about one-third of a percent, Amazon up six-tenths of a percent. Let's take a look at the, at the sector action. Interesting reversal of fortunes today because in the lower right we have XLE, that's energy. That is taking a back seat today as crude oil heading down. And the number one sector is real estate. Uh, not going to make too much of that. We got industrials, tech, and consumer discretionary. Those are also rounding out some of the top names here. And let's take a look inside the market. We got the energy heat map. Uh, again, a lot of these names are just kind of retracing some of those gains that we've seen over the last two days as we saw WTI crude hit, what was it, $92, $93 a barrel. Uh, also taking a look at some bank stocks here. JP Morgan up almost half a percent. So is Bank of America there in the lower left. Wells Fargo, very similar story. So not seeing too much on that front. And let's take a look at some of the leaders here. Um, this gives us a little bit more information than the sectors. In the upper left, the winner this morning up 2% is MJ. That's cannabis. It's interesting to see that. We got some oil, an oil ETF after that, defense, ARC, so we have disruption also jumping this morning. To the downside, it looks like Baito, that's a Bitcoin ETF, that's my proxy for the crypto market. That is down a bit, little bit. China, IPOs, and software. Uh, let's take a look at inside the tech market because we've seen some a bifurcation that I've been tracking over the last few weeks with respect to tech. Uh, semiconductors largely up today. NVIDIA up about 16 basis points, as you see there. Broadcom up about half a percent. So these are, these are the chip stocks. And when we switch over to the software stocks, uh, we also see some green here. Oracle up one third of a percent, Microsoft up one fifth, and then the Salesforce up about three tenths of one percent. Uh, I'm going to leave us and see if we can find any action in the meme stocks here. Uh, doesn't look like any huge movement. Let me sort by performance and we can see Rocket companies up about three and a half percent and some losers here not recognizing too many names. The stalwarts, AMC, GameStop, not seeing too much movement there, guys. So sending it back to you. All right, Jared, uh, we'll be checking back in with you just yes. after the opening bell here. But in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about Don Dollar General here this morning as we've been tracking those shares. They are on the move, and that is after J.P. Morgan cut its rating on the discount retailer from neutral to underweight and reducing their price target to $116. That's down from $132. Now, the analyst is now forecasting a flat comparable store sales growth, uh, saying that Dollar General's core low-income customer is acting recessionary here. You know, some of the details here, and, and it's really kind of part of a, a three-pronged or three-part uh, combination that they outlined. Pandemic-related savings, diminished midsummer uh, for this low-end consumer household income, about $35,000 is what they look at, and saying that that's already at a stress point. Number two, persistent inflation pressures impacting that same cohort and then number three also impacting that cohort is the government assistance reduced by about $40 billion in March and April. Uh, that includes things like child tax care credit expiration, driving tax refunds of about negative uh, 20%, also SNAP cuts. So all of this uh, hitting that low end, that core low end consumer over at Dollar General. Yeah, certainly some worrisome challenges here for Dollar General. And then Brad, that's not all when it comes to the lower income here. When you take a look at the middle income cohort, there's also some interesting uh, notes there from J.P. Morgan about this and that they expect the excess savings there to be depleted by the start of winter. They also mentioned the resumption here of student loan repayments, that yeah. that is going to be a headwind for this group, for this cohort. That could clearly, and we've seen this pointed out by a number of analysts, really affect spending patterns here over the next several months as we head into 2024. And this comes at a time that's already pretty challenging here for the retail uh, sector, more broadly speaking. We know that many companies Companies are struggling with elevated levels of shrink. That was pointed out within this note as well. And then also the need to rely more heavily on promotional activity, right? right? Consumers are very conscious of their budget. They're making strategic movements here. They're, they're, they're faced with these very tough decisions about what they're able to spend money on right now. So they're placing more of an emphasis 
on promotion, on what they're seeing on sale. So these retailers need to respond to that and put some of their items on sale in order to clear some of that inventory. I mean, look, I, I'm sure you remember, as I do when I was growing up, Dollar General meant you were going to a dollar store. Yep. So if you're already putting promotions on some of, and of course they have moved many of those prices higher over the year to kind of get more into the throes of like a five below type of mentality and maintaining prices that are at an affordable clip, but at the same time, not rolling out a mass amount of promotions because you would typically see cons uh, consumers or customers start to trade down into a Dollar General, but where do they trade down further from a Dollar General is a larger question here. Um, and so this JP Morgan note certainly catching investors' attention this morning. It is. Consumers under pressure. JP Morgan there with that downgrade. All right, well, here's the opening bell on Wall Street. Let's do a quick check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. Taking a look and where things are opening, still a bit of pressure here across the board with all three of the major averages. Starting the trading to actually look at that, the Dow and the S&P flipping into positive territory there. The Dow up just about 80 points here at the start of the session. NASDAQ, though, still under pressure, not too far from the flat line ahead of the Fed's decision later on this afternoon on rates. And then, of course, a big focus on the dot plot and what the Fed officials projections will be for potential future rate hikes here before the end of the year. So, Brad, when it comes to what's really moving the market today, clearly, a lot of that movement might come this afternoon following what we hear from Powell. Yeah, 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m., that really the time uh, range to track, especially with some price action correlation there. I'm taking a look at the sectors here, largely in the green. For more context, let's get on over to Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery on a Fed Day to all who celebrate, Jared. Yes, Fed Day, real estate in the lead there. Continuing its trend up from the uh, pre-market, followed by industrials, utilities, materials, and healthcare, and then financials, all of those outperforming. But as you can see, only energy, which was the leader over the last couple of days, that is the only sector in the red. Let's take a le another look at the NASDAQ 100, and we can see more green than red, although the mega caps kind of split. I've got a couple green squares there, a Apple barely holding on to gains. Amazon up about one quarter of a percent. Uh, NVIDIA, Meta, Tesla, Alphabet, Microsoft, all of those in the red. Uh, let's take a look at our leaders again. Not seeing too much of a change. Well, we got home builders in the number one spot, followed by cannabis, meme stocks, gambling stocks, uh, excuse me, crypto on the bottom row there. That kind of tells me that there's a little risk off feeling to the market. But until we get those uh, that final decision here at 2 p.m. and then Powell's comments at 2.30 p.m., not going to put too much stock in whatever we're seeing. Here. Here's the energy market as the uh, weakest sector of the day, the only one in the red. We are seeing some red squares here. But when we take a look at the financials, kind of the opposite story. UBS is a standout. Capital One, those are each up more than 1%. And I was tracking some of the uh, strength within tech. We have semiconductors, kind of a mixed board here. NVIDIA underwater, but just by a little bit. Intel down 1.5%. That is a, a standout. And then software, we got IBM up 1.3%. Microsoft kind of switching between gains and losses there and uh, not seeing too much else in that arena. Got to check out ARK Investment. Disruption can also be, I'm going to sort by equal way, disruption can also be uh, kind of a bellwether. We're not seeing a lot of movement here. DraftKings up 1.5%. But let me just broaden this uh, out, this analysis out to the S&P 500 over the last three months. And uh, before I get there, it looks like we're going to talk about Fed fund probabilities. This is what's looking like will happen today. Ceteris paribus. And that is uh, five and a quarter to five and a half percent. That's probably what we're going to stick with. Looking at the percentages for the next month, well, we're probably, looks like we got 70% 70, 70 chance of standing the uh, standing pad and then a 30% chance of an increase, Brad. All right. That's, a, that's in November. Yeah, exactly. It's a right. long time away. <laughs> we, we've got uh, several weeks until then. Uh, we'll be tracking it closely and taking a look at where these probabilities move, especially off the back of today's meeting. Thanks so much, Jared. Well, we've also got to take a look at Cody stock this morning. Uh, of course, I'm a, a new regular to getting my face beat, so I'm interested in the beauty company raising its fiscal 2024 guidance thanks to strong demand for its fragrances. Cody now expects sales to climb as much as 10% for the year here. There were a few things that that they cited within this, um, whether you're looking at, I don't for all the Burberry Goddess fans out there, the winning launch in the U.S. in August, uh, market sales several times higher than some of their recent competitive blockbuster launches. Uh, but two of those Cody fragrance innovations among the top five of the fall, they cited that and now having three fragrance lines. So things smelling good over at Cody, they really baked that into one of their combination of factors driving acceleration in their volume and sales. And 
now expecting core like for like LFL. If you ever look at any of these releases and see LFL, it's like for like sales growth in the first half of fiscal year 2024, expecting that to come in at about a 10 to 12 percent, an increase from its earlier outlook of five or excuse me, eight to 10 percent was the previous. Yes, yeah, certainly. This is just really a continuation of what we saw in terms of spending patterns that started in the pandemic and then has carried through. Right. When you talk about some of these higher end brands with Cody, with their exposure there to Burberry and Gucci uh, perfumes and fragrances, they're a little bit more insulated from the downturn that we've seen. Consumers are still willing to spend on these items when it comes to some of their luxury items. That's one of the things that they're still opting for. And they're saying, look, Burberry Goddess was called out within this release. It runs about $100 a bottle. So it's going to set people back uh, pretty substantially there when you compare it to maybe some of the other competitors out there that are for sale. So premium fragrances, certainly a standout point here for Cody, expecting sales to rise by up to 10% in this next uh, year here, the fiscal year. And this is a stock that's already up more than 30% year to date. So we'll see whether or not that momentum can continue. You know, I can't help but to think about Kylie Jenner with yes. with anything kind of Cody related here. And, and our own Brooke De Palma was talking about this a couple weeks back, how Kylie Jenner is looking to potentially buy back some of the stake in Cody. And any investor should be tracking that story, um, especially considering the fact that this is a company that moved higher when that partnership, Kali Cosmetics and Cody, was announced. And, of course, the stake uh, and the exchanges that were taking place there as part of that broader deal. Uh, I think for anything Kylie related, especially as it's related to cosmetics, it's had the tendency to be lighter fluid for a company that annexes themselves to someone who has been such a successful influencer, uh, self-made billionaire, if you will. Um, I'll, I'll use the air quotes just because it's not me that came up with it. It's another outlet. But uh, all that said, I think for the for for all of the kind of new fanfare that's been drummed up for Cody, uh, a lot of that has been annexed to how well Kylie Cosmetics has done too, and people knowing where to get that. Uh, look, myself included, I guess. I, I need the tips. I'm, I'm watching more beauty videos. Are you? On, well, you also on do YouTube. your own yeah. makeup. I don't know if everyone out there knows that. It's well, that's why I gotta watch the videos, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, make, looks good. Make no, sure I get the fades. You can and always the, improve the it maybe right. a little bit. All right, Brad, let's talk about another mover here. And maybe it's also one that you're showing a little bit of interest in. And that's Pinterest this morning. Shares are on the move. Now this comes after the company saying that it is expecting year-over-year -year revenue growth. During its first investor day this week, Pinterest saying that they expect a compound annual growth rate over the next three to five years in the mid to high teens. We saw the, we saw the reaction on the street over the last several hours, and analysts seem pretty Pretty pleased with what they heard from the investor day. The note that sticks out to me here, Brad, is from Evercore. Now they have an outperformed rating on the stock of $45 price target, so substantially higher to where Pinterest is trading today. But a couple of things that they said, they said that this was one of the more impressive investor days that they've seen. They're seeing a little bit more interest for Pinterest from marketers, from advertisers, which is so key and so critical here for their business. They also mentioned stronger user engagement. They're winning over Gen Z at Target mm. here that they've been focusing on now for quite some time. They're saying that they've grown that user base by 20%. And then, of course, their partnership with Amazon, obviously helping out just a little bit. I was surprised by Gen Z, though, because when I think of Pinterest, a lot of times I think of moms in their 30s, 40s, 50s okay. that spend a lot of time on Pinterest getting ideas. The fact that they're able to get Gen Z's attention Siphon it away from TikTok and get people to spend more time on that is a massive win for Pinterest. And siphon it away from potentially Instagram, too. Yep. Instagram is becoming a behemoth of its own. I was looking at a report this morning that's just talking about the growth that Instagram is expected to have as a subsidiary, of course, of the meta platforms, family of products. At the end of the day, it's really going to be how the searchability allows people to find inspiration that much mm -hmm. more quickly for Pinterest to be able to make sure that they are maintaining uh, that mind share, but also that time spent, because all of them are competing, for competing for time spent on their platforms, keeping users for there longer, finding more inspiration, and then for the marketers to say, okay, now you've been able to keep people on the platform for an extended period of time. It's about, all right, how can I layer on my own marketing message? And for the marketing component that you mentioned, I think that's the most important one that you brought up, especially from this Evercore ISI note, saying that the marketer interest in the Pinterest platform is rising here. Um, and that's gonna be key to making sure that they're monetizing 
all of those different international views um, and engagements that are remaining on the Pinterest. I know they don't like to be called a social media company. I'm just going to call them a social media company. They are a social media company. Okay, all right, That's cool. what you call them. We're in agreement there. Yeah, yeah. All right. We're also watching the largest EV automaker in the U.S. today as federal prosecutors are scrutinizing the benefits the company may have provided CEO Elon Musk since 2017. This according to a report by the Wall Street Journal. You take a look at shares here this morning. They're still higher by about four-tenths of a percent. Uh, so perhaps investors shrugging this one off just a little bit here. Uh, but no doubt Elon Musk's compensation has been at the core of focus at different points over the past We'll say five years here. You think back to 2018, the infamous going private, uh, funding secured tweet that restructured his entire compensation package. That took it out to tranches for him to get rewarded based on some of the stock performance as well. And so all of that considered, uh, I think the Department of Justice is going to have a lot at these different phases to look through as to what he was awarded as a result of the different restructuring packages within his own compensation plan that uh, were executed. Yeah, of course that. And then there's also Project 42. Which which was a secret project inside yes. Tesla. And there's lots of questions just about the funding there, where exactly that came from, how or whether or not some of those funds were misused or misappropriated. So that's something that reportedly from the journal that regulators are looking into the DOJ expanding their investigation here. So they're looking at more transactions between Tesla, Musk, and then also some of the other companies that are controlled by Musk. So no real impact on the stock, at least for right now, but this is just another challenge for yeah. Musk, a man that doesn't seem to have a lot of extra time, and nor should he with everything that he has on his plate right now, all the companies that he is running, all the projects, initiatives that are underway. So this could be a bit of a challenge here, depending on what regulators are able to uncover and exactly how far this probe potentially goes. He's still got enough time to tweet. He, he finds that. Yeah. He makes time to tweet. But I, Three or, in the morning, four in the morning. Or post, I should say. Yeah, he or does. Whatever, he are we Xing, Xing now? I don't know. Uh, we're going to figure all that out. We'll workshop it. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, we're going to leave that conversation there for now. But keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. Have you tried pickleball yet? I have not tried pickleball. I can't move left to right. My knees are shot from too many years of playing soccer and skateboarding. So I can't do pickle, but I can play plenty of golf. Plenty of golf. All right. Well, I'll meet you out there then. We'll have a great deal of time there.
We're here with you live from the NASDAQ market site. Now let's get you the market commentary of the day. And that's we're starting here with Bank of America's Savita Subramanian, the latest strategist to boost her year-end outlook for the S&P 500. She now sees the S&P ending the year at 4,600. That's up from her earlier target of 4,300, thanks to higher valuations and also strong macro data. Now, Supermanian's uh, hike here, S&P year-end hike, follows a number of strategists that have done the same thi thing here. The team at SockGen raising their year-end target to 47.50. That was up from 4,300. We also know Oppenheimer's John Stoltzfus did that as well. His is among, I believe, the highest on the street at 4,900 by year-end. But, Brad, let's talk a little bit about what we're hearing from Savita and the team at Bank of America yeah. because it's a bit of a boost here, up about 3% from where she was before at 4,300. So clearly, many of these strategists have been bracing for a recession, the tougher economic environment, given the fact that the Fed has been raising rates, will likely be in this higher for longer camp uh, for a little bit longer because of sticky inflation, yet the market continues to brush that off. Yeah, particularly interesting, and I love the title of this, Savita. Kudos to you. You get 25 points on the day. Um, don't worry. Be happy. The name of this Target update uh, from B of A and, and Savita Supermanian. But particularly, one of the things that actually jumps out to me from this note is saying that everyone still hates stocks except seven. Of course, we are talking about you, the Magnificent Seven, <laughs> and saying that sentiment is more bearish than bullish. Their sell-side indicator implies 15% upside over the next 12 months. S&P 500 consensus growth expectations are almost an all-time low. And X the Magnificent Sevens, 15% expectations. Uh, we're looking at some, some other all-time lows that they note here. Uh, one in five funds have under 40% of assets under management um, in TMT, but are 16% underweight, the average stock here. So a lot to really digest here, uh, but that one additional kind of nod to the, the AI play of the Magnificent Seven that we have seen over the course of 2023 here. Speaking of which, the AI hype, yeah, you know it's real, and we're not talking about Allen Iverson, although we love him. And the chip industry here, they're going all in on artificial intelligence. Intel kicked off its annual innovation event in San Jose, California on Tuesday. Semiconductor company announcing a series of updates on its product roadmap to other demos of various new AI applications. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger emphasized the importance of AI and what it'll have on the company going forward, saying, quote, Intel is going to build AI into every platform we build. For more on what lies ahead for Intel, we've got Stiefel analyst Ruben Roy. Ruben, are you surprised? Are you invested? Or, well, not invested. Are you, um, are you impressed is what I meant to say at all by what you've heard from Intel early moments here at the event? Hi, Brad. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, uh, Intel's making steps towards a very ambitious goal that the company undertook a few years ago under Pat Gelsinger and you know, we're, we're starting to see some progress. So that's a good thing. Uh, I think there are a lot of moving parts here and it's gonna take some time before we can really assess the uh, success of, of some of these moving parts. But, uh, you know, certainly some interesting updates. As you mentioned, all in on AI. And I think, uh, you know, that's the right place to, to be. We've seen what's gone on with NVIDIA and even AMD this year. And uh, while in, Intel's a little bit late potentially to the game, uh, you know, obviously a huge company with a lot of uh, historical IP and uh, wouldn't count them out, but it's a little bit early to tell how successful they're going to be um, in the near term. So, Ruben, there's lots of excitement around those AI announcements, but the data center inventory, that seemed to overshadow some of that hype. We saw Intel, the worst performer on the S&P yesterday. Was some of that downside action that we saw in the market, was that a bit of an overreaction? I think so. I, you know, I think uh, for Intel, certainly, which has been outperforming over the last several months, still underperforming year to date. Uh, you know, I think you have to look past the next couple of quarters, and and you know, sort of, if you if you want to be bullish Intel, you really have to have a thesis that they are going to be able to execute on the transformation of the company. Really, so investors looking at sort of this quarter, next quarter on you know single segment businesses, I think is a little bit. Um, short-sighted. Now, having said that, Intel a few weeks ago at an investor conference did say that they were tracking above uh, the midpoint of their Q3 guidance, and then yesterday said, "Hey, you know, data center is a little bit better, but still uh, down uh, for the for the quarter." And as you mentioned, uh, in inventory digestion continuing through the end of this year. So I think a little bit of potentially expectations getting ahead of themselves after a few weeks ago, and now coming back in.
Ruben, in your investment thesis, uh, and, and this was off the back of the most recent earnings for Intel, you had said that you believe they have a difficult road ahead as the company begins a multi-year transition phase involving high capital intensity, ambitious design roadmap, expectations to move through five process node transitions in four years. Did what you heard, did what you hear at this event change the timeline at least and believe that they can deliver on this sooner than what was previously expected? The timeline hasn't changed. Uh, I, I'd say they are making progress, like I mentioned uh, earlier, and, and five notes in four years is certainly a, a, a very, very complicated and difficult um, task to execute on. So kudos to Intel you know, for getting through two of the nodes pretty pretty well at, at this point. And you know, they have cited uh, uh, you know, timelines for the next nodes to be launched on time next year. So they're executing on that, certainly. The question then becomes, you know, you still have this large capital intensity, you're separating the businesses into design and manufacturing, uh, you're dependent on capital offsets, which sound like they're going pretty well. Uh, you know, obviously a massive in investment cycle, uh, you know, here for Intel. So I, I would say, you know, as of yesterday in innovation, Intel innovation, certainly happy to see these steps, you know, being uh, executed on, but still think, Brad, that we have a long way to go. Ruben, when it comes to these new AI chips, I know you were saying obviously much later than many of their competitors, but is it enough to maybe draw some of that attention away from NVIDIA, away from AMD, the two real leaders within the space? Well, the, the Gaudi platform that Intel acquired uh, from Havana Labs, they talked about a billion dollar plus pipeline of uh, you know customer engagement, if you will. They haven't really defined pipeline and, and Dave Zinsner, the CFO, did say yesterday that not all of the pipeline uh, historically transitions to, to actual revenue. Near-term revenues are modest. Um, so, you know, it's sort of for us still a wait and see, but it is um, certainly interesting that uh, the company is getting some customer traction to the point where they can go out and talk about this level of, of, of pipeline. Now, if you look at NVIDIA revenue over the last several quarters, obviously multiples of billions of dollars in AI specific Revenue, you know, actually, actually being uh, <laughs> executed on, put into the model today. So uh, again, I, I think if there's a takeaway here for our discussion, it'd be Intel's making some progress, but uh, you know, we still have to see some of that pipeline transition to revenue, some of these foundry customers transition to actually, you know, revenue-paying customers, and continued ex execution on this uh, challenging roadmap. How much of Intel's roadmap? hinges on what NVIDIA is, is doing and whether or not they can successfully steal share at, at a clip that analysts like yourself are expecting? I, you know, I, I think these are two companies, two separate companies and, and Intel's going about, you know, their business the, the way that Intel, you know, goes about their business and NVIDIA is doing what they do. Uh, there's more to this story though than just the hardware aspect of it, right? So NVIDIA has got what we think as, of as, you know, this triumvirate, it's got the hardware, it's got networking, it's got software. Software is probably the key piece that investors don't think too much about when they think about these semiconductor chip companies. And for Intel, I would say, and even you know, it could be true for AMD as well, you know, they're behind what NVIDIA has done on the software side. NVIDIA has been investing in an operating system that happens to play very well in accelerated compute, which is playing very well with AI and generative AI. They've been investing in that operating system for quite a while now. So it's a little bit of a catch up game for companies like Intel. So they are executing on sort of, you know, the way they're looking at the, the you know, longer term uh, market opportunity here. But again, they have, they have a number of avenues to execute on before they can start to talk about, hey, is Intel you know, going to start to eat into a little bit of share that NVIDIA has gained over the last couple of years? Well, Intel shares off another 1.5% so far this morning. Ruben Roy, always great to speak with you. Analyst with Stiefel. Thanks. Thanks. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. You have tons of great economic analysis, markets analysis as well, but you're also training for the New York Marathon. <laughs> what is your number one tip for all the runners out there that are perhaps trying to get their miles in and see you when they're running throughout the five boroughs here in New York later? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, first of all, you, you have to be really determined to do it. You know, do not give up because as much as it can be very painful and exhausting, you know, when you get through that, you feel great. So just keep going 
and keep training with consistency. You know, you, you can't slack off, so to speak. <laughs> you gotta do it every other day, I would say, or every two days, and really put in the work. You'll, you'll make it. We're joining you live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Now, the UAW's so-called historic strike is expected to heat up later this week with the union threatening to up the ante and hit more plants. Now, it's true that work stoppages like the auto workers strike are less common than they were back in the heyday for the unions in the 1950s. So what does this mean for the state of labor and the economy? Here with more on that and what's on his radar, we've got Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Rick. Tell us more how this compares to what we saw decades ago in the 1950s. Uh, research from Capital Eco Economics put out a note uh, yesterday talking about the nature of work stoppages in the United States. And uh, they did a chart that really caught my interest. I think we can put it on the screen. I mean, the number of work stoppages is so much lower than it was in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and even the early 1980s, that it has almost stopped being a thing. Um, in the labor uh, market. So we have some prominent strikes here in 2023. Uh, obviously, the UAW strike, which is just getting started and seems like it's likely to intensify and last for at least a couple of weeks. We still have ongoing strikes by, uh, uh, by the Writers Guild and by the Actors Guild in Hollywood. Um, and some labor activists are pointing to this and saying, wow, we have a big boom in strike activity here in 2023. Uh, this could be the return of labor unions and maybe great news for workers. I'm not I'm not so sure about that. I, I think that the long term trend here has been away from strikes. And that probably is a good thing for the economy overall. I mean, l you know, labor unrest is obviously disruptive. Um, and uh, the thing we can point to here in 2023, you know, economists are now saying how much damage is this actually going to cause the broader U.S. economy? And the answer is hardly any. Um, hardly any damage to the U.S. economy, even if this strike drags on for a couple of months. Um, now, it will hurt the auto sector, but we've got two months of supply of most vehicles for the auto manufacturers. So uh, dealerships ought to stay stocked. And when you look at what economists are saying about the overall effect on the economy, I mean, it's in the uh, decimal points of GDP, even in a worst case scenario. So getting a lot of tension, but, um, you know, strikes just almost don't happen anymore. Rick, we know you've also been following everything about the strikes, but also who is visiting, who is saying what about the strikes. 
Uh, and we understand that former President Trump has also been making some selective visits. What do you know about that so far? Well, he, he, he said that his plan is, uh, instead of uh, participating in the next Republican debate, which I think is on September 27th, he's going to go somewhere to uh, somewhere in the upper Midwest and address striking auto workers. Now, this is um, interesting because the UAW, United Auto Workers Union, did not endorse Trump in 2020. Uh, the union endorsed Joe Biden in 2020. And Trump, of course, is pissed off about that. So the main thing he's been saying about the strike is that uh, the UAW leaders suck and they're selling out the workers. So uh, very interesting to see what kind of message Trump is going to have for the union workers. He's not He's not really taking their side so much against the automakers that they are striking. He's taking the auto workers' side against their own union leaders um, who are the ones representing them in these strikes. So if that's what comes off, I mean, that's a fairly muddled message from Trump. I'm not sure that's going to do him any good. But look, I mean, we all know he's looking for ways to um, get some attention without attending the GOP debates. So uh, I wonder if the storyline is going to emerge that Trump is kind of using the auto workers just as a, an attention-getting ploy for himself. Rick, always a pleasure to know what's on your radar. We got we to gotta get a graphic for you, like so, something to really kick <laughs> off the segment or something. Uh, we'll, we'll workshop it. I, I, I made I something some in PowerPoint. I know producers you guys can to talk to. I'll slack you. Okay, sounds good. I, I mean, I made something in the Bye meantime. Too. I'll, I'll send effort. it to you. Collaborative yes. effort. We, 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 we've Bye, all got... All right. <laughs> all hands on deck here for you, Rick. All your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market side. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. If there was one streaming service that you had to cut, what would it be? Oh, I have to admit, I've been a little annoyed with Max. Hmm. It's so hard. Like, every time I, I want to download stuff, it's so limited. It, I find it challenging. Have you finished everything that you wanted to watch on there? And, and now you're just kind of like, all right, I'm good to go here. Yeah, I mean, I took a trip to Hawaii for a work trip, and I was on the plane so long, I needed more. Mm -hmm. And I have to share it with my husband, so that, that makes it challenging, <laughs> you know, because like, he wants to download a lot too, so. Certainly. Yeah.
Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith. That's Shauna Smith. And here we are. We find ourselves 34 minutes into the start of today's trading session. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks ticking higher ahead of the Federal Reserve's decision on interest rates this afternoon. The Fed is largely expected to keep rates on hold, with traders pricing in a 99% chance of a pause, according to the CME FedWatch tool. And the S&P 500, you're also looking at that fractionally higher here on the day. Taking a look at some of the individual movers, we are watching Disney. The stock essentially flat actually this morning. Now it had been moving on news that the entertainment company is planning to invest around $60 billion over the next decade into theme parks and into cruise lines to build out some of its more successful business segments. And we're also watching Instacart shares today. They're slumping after its big IPO debut. The stock is on the move lower by about 6% today. The grocery delivery company went public on the NASDAQ and Instacart's stock opened at $42 a share, about 40% higher than the anticipated $30 a share. We are also watching shares of General Mills, now the maker of some of America's best known consumer products. Now this includes Cheerios, it includes Betty Crocker. They released earnings this morning, beating the street's estimates, also reiterating their full year guidance, saying that inflation and supply chain pressures have eased in the latest quarter. Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi, he will be speaking with the CEO of General Mills this morning, later on this hour. You wanna stay tuned for that. Well, expecting a hawkish hold, the Fed is widely expected to hold rates steady at today's meeting. There seems to be a consensus among Wall Street that the pause in rate hikes this month might be the right move. But the big question here is, are we still on course for one more quarter point hike this year? For more on the Fed's policy decision, we are joined by Kathy Jones, Charles Schwab's chief fixed income strategist. We also have Gina Smilek, New York Times, Federal Reserve and Economy reporter. Great to see both of you. Gina, let me start with you because you've got a great pulse of what is going on in the Fed, what exactly those conversations are are like amongst Fed officials right now, given the recent spike that we've seen in energy prices. What do you think the tone, what do you think the narrative is going to be this afternoon? You know, I think with the Fed in general recently, it's really been about keeping your options open, remaining flexible, remaining, you know, wary and conscious that the storyline can change. You know, the Fed was really burned pretty badly in 2021 when they expected inflation to fade and then discovered it didn't. So I think that while they've been really encouraged by the slowdown in inflation this summer, which really has sort of confirmed a lot of what they had expected might happen and has actually even been a little bit quicker than a lot of Fed officials were predicting, I think that they're going to be hesitant to take a victory lap um, just because they don't want to be caught out again. They don't want to say, you know, we've won the inflation battle. This is over. We've, we've done the done the deed. And then only to discover that inflation reaccelerates because of oil prices or because of some other factor. And Kathy, I want to bring you into this as well. I mean, at the last meeting, nine members were looking for one more rate hike. Three uh, were looking for more than that, according to the dot plot data. Where do you believe the consensus will be? following today's conclusion of their two-day meeting? I think it will stay. The overwhelming consensus will still stay with um, one more rate hike because I don't think that there's, as Gina mentioned, just a lot of confidence that they can declare victory yet and they know that we're done uh, with the rate hikes uh, because of the uncertainty around inflation going forward. But there may be a little bit of a migration down. So some of those dots that were above that line might move a little bit lower. Maybe a couple at the median will move down a little bit. It seems to be a great growing kind of consensus among a, a, at least a small number of Fed officials that perhaps enough has been done for now and that they should continue to be patient. But overall, um, as Gina mentioned, I think they want to keep their options open. I don't think they want to signal that uh, they have uh, too much confidence that, that they've you know, declared victory at this stage of the game. Gina, what do you think Fed officials need to see in order to feel a bit more comfortable moving on to that next phase of policy? You know, I think what they probably want to see is a continuation of some of the trends that we saw really start to take hold this summer. So I think they've been waiting for a concerted slowdown in the labor market, and you're finally starting to get that. Um, so I think that's going to make them believe that supply and demand for workers is coming back into balance and that we might see sort of sustainable growth going forward there. 
I think they probably want to see a slowdown in consumer spending. I'm not sure that that's really materialized to the degree that they had expected so far. You know, we're still getting pretty good retail sales reports. If you read earnings calls, people are nervous, but you know, Walmart's expecting a really good holiday season. And so I think that's that's been kind of a mixed bag. And then finally, I think they really truly are just looking at these inflation figures. You know, we've seen a real slowdown, both in goods, which they were always expecting those to slow down, but also in some important services categories in recent months. And I think if that's sustained, that's going to make Fed officials a lot more confident that they've sort of done what they needed to do to make sure that inflation comes sort of sustainably back under control. Ginny, just to stay with you for a hot second, is there a magic word that we could potentially hear from the Fed that would quell some of the market's concerns, perhaps around any uncertainty that, that could proceed at the end of today's meeting? Yeah, you know, I think that I don't know if there's one single magic word, but I think that anything that you hear about risks being balanced, balanced might be a, a magic word there. You know, for a long time, Fed officials have been very clear that the risk of inflation was the risk they were more concerned about. They were more worried that inflation was going to stay out of control than they were that they were going to do too much and hurt the economy. The more that they're trying to balance those two risks, you know, not trying to overdo it and hurt the economy too much on one hand and, you know, make sure, making sure that they slow things enough to get inflation under control on the other, the more those are being balanced, the less likely it is that the Fed is going to be willing to tolerate or precipitate a recession. And so I think from the market's perspective, that would be a very good news. Kathy, what do you think about the moves that we've seen in the 10-year yield? Here we are, I guess we're pulling back this morning just a little bit from the highest levels that we've seen since 2007. Have we peaked? Are we near peak levels for the 10-year yield? Yeah, we think we're near peak levels. You can't um, you can't rule out a further move up in yields from here, depending on how growth performs. Um, but what's interesting about this move in yields, it's, it's all been real yields uh, after adjusting for inflation expectations. So it's really been an adjustment to a stronger path of economic growth. And uh, I think the supply coming in as we grow deficits, you know, the idea that there'll be more and more financing that needs to be done by the Treasury, and that's boosted yields a bit. But I think as we turn the corner and get more confidence in the decline in inflation, which we're expecting to happen over the next couple of months, then those yields will roll over. So typically, we have an inverted yield curve. Typically, you know, at the end of the rate hike cycle, you have this inverted yield curve with short-term rates higher than long-term rates. As you go into the other side of the cycle, you see it reverse. Uh, with short-term rates falling relative to long-term rates and, and the whole curve coming down. So that's our expectation sometime in 2024. And when you think about what's going to really be taking up a lot of the air today, Kathy, I mean, anything from housing, oil, still the, the international part of, of, of what's playing out, especially driving oil and the correlation there. What do you think the, the top discussion point that the Fed is going to have to really wade through over these past two days has been or has to be? I think it's more the labor market. So oil prices, you know, the Fed typically looks through food and energy because they're so volatile. And frankly, there's not much they can do if OPEC cuts supply and pushes the price mm -hmm. up. They can't keep adjusting monetary policy every time crude rallies 5 or $10, right? That would be a highly volatile policy setting. Obviously, if that flows through, those crude prices flow through to finished goods in a sustainable way, that's a concern for the Fed. But I do think that they'll focus more on the labor market um, and that that's one of the one of the issues that they've been watching really closely. Uh, we've seen growth uh, in a job growth slow down a bit. We've seen wage growth slow down a bit. I think the question for the Fed will be, you know, has enough been done to loosen up that labor market so that we're not getting that push uh, for inflation coming from the, uh, the growth in income above inflation? I think we're probably turning that corner. But again, I'm not sure the Fed is going to be overly confident of it. And that's what they're going to be focused on. Yeah, if they were to add on the uh, OPEC policy hat onto their plate, then they certainly would be moving from dual mandate up to a Trinity-type mandate. We don't want that. Kathy Jones, uh, Charles Schwab's chief fixed income strategist, as well as Gina Smilek, who is the New York Times Federal Reserve and Economy reporter. We've got a lot to watch here later today as well. We know you will be, too. Thanks so much for joining us here ahead of the Fed decision. Thank you. And we're...
Absolutely. Well, we're here at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. Let's do a check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. We're higher across the board for the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, seeing fractional gains for all three U.S. major averages. The Dow up by about four tenths of a percent. We'll be generous and round that up to S&P 500. That's up two tenths of a percent in the NASDAQ composite. Flat just barely to the upside by hair when it's chinny chin chin. We'll see if it can hold on to that green. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ in Times Square. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back. General Mills out with better than expected earnings. The company sold a lot of Cheerios, a lot of Cinnamon Toast Crunch, but maybe had a little bit of a challenging quarter in pet food. Let's get right to General Mills Chairman and CEO, Jeff Harmon. And Jeff, always great to see, with, see you. Uh, it's been a while. Thanks for hopping on right after your earnings call here. Good quarter for you guys. Uh, beat on earnings. Guidance looked uh, intact. But let's start on that pet business. Um, you called out some weakness in wet uh, pet food and pet treats. Now, those things, stuff's not exactly cheap. It's a little expensive for some households. What do you think those trends there say about the U.S. economy? Well, Brian, first, it's it's good to be back with you again. And you're right, we had a good first quarter. In fact, we've had a good run over the last few years. We're a $20 billion business with $9 billion brands. As it relates to pet food, it was a tough quarter, but a couple of pieces of context. The first is that we've doubled the size of our pet food business since we bought Blue Buffalo five years ago. And uh, we think this trend toward humanization is going to continue. In the short term, it is clear that mobility, uh, pet parents are more mobile than they have been. And going back to the office more, and so they're treating less, a little bit less wet pet food. So that was a drag on our sales. However, our dry pet food sales were up. So that's positive. And in the short term, uh, consumers are seeking a little bit more value. And so we're taking actions 
like improving our advertising and doing what we call price pack architecture to make sure we hit certain price points. So even though our sales were flat, we're, we're thrilled with what Blue Buffalo has done for us and we see a bright future ahead for it. Jeff, wow, I, gosh, I remember when you guys made that Blue Buffalo acquisition. It seems like yesterday, but it's been a, a couple of years now uh, already. What is that, why is the consumer opting for dry dog food? Is, is there just, or and even cat food, is there just more value in that bigger bag than, than buying wet food? Yeah, there, there are really two reasons, Brian. The first is that there, there is more value in dry dog food. The price per pound is lower than it is for a wet pet food. The other thing is a lot more convenient. So you can leave out dry dog food or dry cat food and have your pet eat it throughout the day if you're not going to be there, which is something you probably don't want to do with wet pet food. And so for those two reasons, we're seeing nice growth in our uh, dry dog food business. You talked on the earnings call a lot about uh, standing up some bold advertising for Blue, uh, Blue Buffalo uh, in the coming quarters. Talk to us about that. Well, you know, Blue Buffalo was founded on the premise that we we feed our pets like family. And we want to make sure that, that pet parents know what's in Blue Buffalo and compare that to what's in other dog food. Because if you're going to pay a premium, which consumers do for things like for Blue Buffalo, you want to make sure you know that what you're getting is better than what you could have gotten otherwise. And so, especially as consumers are looking for value, we think it's important that, that consumers, pet parents know exactly what's in Blue Buffalo and why that's different than other pet foods. And so we call that the true blue promise. It's the way the brand was founded. We've stayed true to that. And we're kind of really going back to our roots. That focus on value by the consumer, Jeff, is that being reflected in those, those namesake businesses like a, like a Cheerios, like a Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and also in your snack business? You know, it, it, it is being, you know, when, when consumers get pressed, the first thing they, they, they go back to the supermarket, they go to at home eating. And so we are a value player when it comes to, to at home eating versus eating at restaurants. In fact, eating at restaurants is about four times more expensive. I can't afford to As go out, Jeff. At, I can't afford to go out. Darn is going to report earnings this week. I'll have gone. I mean, I can't afford this stuff anymore. It's crazy. But but as you say, you know, our, our cereal sales are good. And, and, that's be, and that's because cereal offers a great value. It's convenient. It tastes good. It's good for you. All of our cereals are whole grain. Yes, Cheerios is whole grain, but so is Cinnamon Toast Crunch. They also taste good. And so those are the three things that make cereal so attractive. And, and cereal tends to perform well in these kind of markets. You made a very important point on the earnings call, Jeff, you and your team. You said consumers might be focusing on value, but they're not eating less. Is that correct? Well, that, that is correct. You know, consumers just finding value, they're trying to find value in places where they shop. And so they, they're looking for places where they can get a better deal. And that might be a club store or a mass merchandiser or a dollar store. But they're also looking at things like the package size itself. And if I was getting a large size, now maybe I want to get a medium size because I want to, I want to make sure the things don't go to waste. Importantly, they're still looking to our brands as they as they always have, because it's also important uh, when you don't want to waste food that your family's going to eat it. And when you have products like General Mills with our nine billion dollar brands, they got there for a reason. And that's because consumers love them. And so even though consumers are looking for value, that only doesn't only mean price. It means convenience. It means great taste. It means nutrition. It really means something your family's going to eat. It sounds like uh, you and team are very focused over the next couple quarters at taking market share, whether it's more market share in cereal, more market share in snacks. Talk to us about the innovation, some new products that you have coming down the pipeline. Uh, you know, we're always we're always focused on on market share because it's it's one of the things that we can control. And we've grown our market share in more than 50% of our categories for five years in a row. And it's because we're focused on advertising. We're, our advertising was up double digits in the first quarter. Our new, as you mentioned, our new product innovation is really good. We have uh, haagen uh in the yogurt aisle now, which uh, is off to a good start. We have a mini varieties of things like Lucky Charms and Cocoa Puffs. I mean, it's hard to resist those kind of things. And we have haagen ice cream outside the U.S., macaron, which is off to a phenomenal start outside the U.S. And so we're really pleased with our new product efforts. In fact, in cereal, we have four of the top five new products over the last year and almost a 50% share of all new products in cereal. And so whether it's getting back to our good marketing, which we're doing, or innovating, or getting good distribution, or distribution is up this year. Those are the kind of things that, that we're really focused on, is executing the things that we could control. Another thing that stood out to me, Jeff, is uh, as it pertains to guidance, you noted it looked like you're still factoring in moderating inflation. Now, it's not lost on me and the people watching this all over the world that today is Fed Day, and the Fed is likely to come out and say, well, inflation has moderated, but now it's starting to pick up with oil back over $100 a barrel. How concerned are you about the inflation outlook? 
Well, we've been dealing with inflation for the last few years. If you look at the last three years, including this one, inflation for our business is up 30%. Now, importantly, um, as we look at the year ahead, inflation is only 5%. So it's moderated from 13% last year to 5% this year. So it's gone down, but it hasn't gone away. And it's hard for me to see a scenario where inflation has is going to go away completely. It's at 5% for us this year. For us, the good news is we have productivity gains, and that's our first line of defense. We have about generate about 4% of savings in productivity every year. We have a little bit of pricing. And so we should be able to manage this okay. But for, for the viewers who think that inflation is going to zero, that's not the way we see it. And we, we believe that labor will probably be the main driving force of inflation, even if it's going to be less than what it was a year ago. Fair enough. And in the, in the last few minutes that we have uh, with you here, Jeff, uh, look, we showed your bio. You are not afraid of making big deals for this company. Now, you were rumored to have some interest in, in Hostess. Now, I know you can't talk too much about that. Uh, of course, uh, Smarker looks to have gotten uh, that one. But you have acknowledged that you've maybe been a little bit boring uh, with acquisitions on that earnings call. Talk to us about the priority to make that big deal at General Mills over the next 12 months. Yeah, we're really pleased. We, you're right. We don't talk about any specific um, deals and rumors and things like that. But we've been very consistent over time on what we think. I mean, the most important thing we can do is grow our core and grow our core business. And, and then we add on top of that. And we've been successful at growing, growing both our core business, but also successful at M&A. And it's true if you look at Blue Buffalo, if you look at Annie's, if you look at the Petri business we bought from Tyson, TNT, Pizza Crest. So we have we have made really good gains in acquisitions. And we'll look to make some acquisitions into the future. We think our growth rate now is roughly 2.5%. We'd like to add 50 basis points of growth through acquisitions and divestitures. But we're also disciplined as to how we do it. And we've always been disciplined. Uh, we've got a good balance sheet. Our, we like our core business, and, but we will still be on the lookout for, for assets that we think can accelerate our growth and mm -hmm. things that we, be, we will be particularly capable of doing well, but we'll be disciplined as we do that. So we've seen this battle for, for a hostess, but we've also seen Campbell, Campbell's Food, uh, of course, spend a lot of money to buy Rayo's pasta sauce. Does big food, is your industry at a moment where you need these type of really transformational acquisitions again, like they were done in the past to, to jumpstart sales growth? No, we don't. I mean, before the pandemic, before we bought Blue Buffalo, we were growing at a trajectory of zero to 1%. Now we think we're at two and a half. And so whether it's being more competitive on our core or through the acquisitions or divestitures we've done, like Yoplait in Europe, we've added to our growth rate already. And so we don't need to add more in order to be able to grow. Now it and and the idea of replacing what's happening now with growth is not something that we really consider. We look at long term and what's the long term potential of our business. And so, um, while we would like to do deals, we like the businesses we have. We like the fact that our dividend is growing and we're returning money to shareholders. And if we don't find something we'll, uh, that we can grow, we will be happy to to repurchase shares. Jeff, you almost got me yesterday in, the, in my local supermarket. Almost picked up uh, some pumpkin spice Cheerios. I think I saw that on the shelves, right? I would recommend it. I'm sure you would. Jeff Harmony, General Mills <laughs> Chairman and CEO. Always nice to get some time with you. Don't be a stranger. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brian. All right. We'll be uh, right back. Lots uh, more market coverage here on Yahoo Finance. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live, everyone, this morning. Let's get on over to Jared Blickery for a quick look at the markets here as we're one hour into trading on the session, Jared. Hey there. Well, let's take a look at the Wi-Fi Interactive. You can see the NASDAQ has now dipped into negative territory. Let's take a look at the day's price action since midnight. And you can see we got that FOMC drift, uh, that pre-market, and also sometimes into the regular trading day, that little drift higher. Uh, but we've now given that up. And uh, let's take a look also at the Dow. That's up a half a percent now. So that's continuing to add to gains. Really interesting. Um, you know, I, it's FOMC day. So let's take a look at the interest rate structure. 10-year yields are camping out near the highs of the last 15 years. You'd have to go, go back all the way to 2007 to see that. But what I want to take a look at now is the 13-week T-bill rate. And that's three months. Let's take a, a look at the year to date. This closely tracks the uh, Fed's benchmark rate. It's at 5.3% right now. And it has just been on fire. It doesn't show any signs of rolling over, uh, which you might expect if the Fed were to come out a little bit hawkish, dovish. Uh, there's so many different permutations, difficult to uh, kind of conceive sometimes. But I'm also looking at the U.S. dollar because that also could be rolling over. Um, it is at some potential long-term resistance. Here's a five-year, and you can see there we go, right at that kind of Rubicon right there. Higher dollar with higher rates, and they kind of feed each other in a feedback loop. Uh, if you do have higher rates, people are going to buy dollars so they can buy the bonds. Um, but that also kind of flags, it just kind of weighs on the growth of uh, growth stocks like mega caps and those without, um, those are, I guess you would say, the longer term duration stocks. So let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100 and we can see the mega caps right there. Some of these guys uh, off a little bit. Google down about one and a quarter percent. Apple off not quite one percent. Uh, Intel, the biggest loser that I'm seeing here, that's down three percent. And here's a year to date chart of Pat Gelsinger's uh, chart uh, company here in the midst of their turnaround strategy. And you can see we got that upward sloping trend channel here and we're just coming back down to the lower end of it. So not a big deal when we're considering the price action there. Also want to take a look at the leaders, um, still seeing cannabis towards the top. Then we got uh, regional banks, and then we have gambling, home builders, and solar. To the downside, New York Fang, well, that is going to include some of those mega caps that we were just looking at in the red. Uh, Baito, that is a proxy for the crypto and Bitcoin sphere. That's down along with China and chip stocks. And speaking of chip stocks, let's take a look at the semiconductors. And uh, already went over Intel, uh, not seeing too much of uh, the moves, uh, not seeing too many outsides move here. Western Digital, way down here, almost can't see it, it's behind me. That is up 6%, guys. Year to date, it is up 50%. All right, Jared, thanks. We want to talk about the moves or the lack thereof, I guess, that we've seen in volatility. The, fa the favorite measure here of volatility, well, well, it's been pretty quiet over the past month. The VIX has fallen for most of the year, but many, some believe that it's about to change. Yahoo Finance reporter Josh Schaefer is here to tell us more. Josh, what could uh, shake things up here? Yeah, Sean, I mean, there's really quite a few things that could shake things up, right? So you take a look at that VIX chart, you see that it's been largely unchanged for the last couple months. And now we've had a couple strategists we've spoken to recently say that they think that's going to change for really a long list of headwinds. When you think about all the different things we've been talking about, today is Fed Day. We're talking about if the Fed is going to hike one more time. They're not likely to hike those interest rates today. But remember, that November meeting is being heavily debated right now. And so that's something that we're watching. And then when you think about other headwinds, we've been talking a lot about the, the auto worker strike, the union strike happening there. We've been talking a lot about oil prices. We've been talking a lot about other things that are all weighing on the market. You can see more on your screen now when you think about student loan repayments, the possible government shutdown coming on October 1st. So a lot of these things, what strategists say, for, take for instance, the United Auto Workers strike. Economists don't believe that that would be a massive headwind for the economy and for growth. But when you can pile that with student loan repayments, when you can pile that with a potential government shutdown and people paying more for gas out of pocket, you can see how this all starts to add up and really kind of have a compounding effect. And that's what people are starting to be worried about and really predicting a little bit of choppiness in the near term here, not necessarily in the long term. I thought Keith Werner over at True has put, for instance, the government shutdown in great perspective. He said, in the long run, government shutdowns come and go, right? We don't normally see a lot of impact on the stock market in the long run. But in the short term, it almost always provides at least a little bit of choppiness. 
So we're just thinking, you know, a little bit of chop, but maybe that boat ride gets a little bit smoother once we get out of the fall here, maybe out of October. Josh, what are some of the reasons that investors or even some of the portfolio managers out there are pointing for in terms of positivity in the market? Yeah, Brad. So, I mean, you take a look at Bank of America out today, Savita Subramanian, her team, the equity strategy team, boosting their year-end target for the S&P 500 to 4,600 from 4,300. And a lot of that is because we still haven't seen a run-up in some of the stocks outside of that Magnificent Seven, those mega cap stocks that we talk about a lot. So they see opportunity in the other S&P 500 index that doesn't account for the weight or the the weighted S&P 500 index, so you take out the top heavy part that is run by mega caps, they see opportunity there. Bank of America also still doesn't see a recession, right? So when you think about the base case here, if you're thinking the economy is still going to be strong, then that means corporate profits could still be strong. Bank of America thinks that corporate profit, the trough in profits, was actually last quarter, the earnings season we just had, and we're going to see an increase in Q3. Well, what's one of the number one drivers for stocks? It's profits and earnings, right? So that would be beneficial for stocks when you think about it that way. So there's sort of two sides here. And I think really what the market's trying to figure out, Julian Emanuel over Evercore put this great, is good news, good news right now, or good news, bad news in terms of stocks. And a lot of that has to do with what we hear later today from Jerome Powell and how the Fed is thinking. Is a strong economy a good thing because we're headed for a soft landing or is a strong economy too strong? And that means the Fed needs to hike again. Hopefully we get a little bit of that info today at 2.30, guys. I know I'm going to be listening for it. Yeah, or as Savita put it in that Bank of America Global Research note, don't worry, be happy. Right, Josh? That's something that we're always, gonna, always a little Bob Marley, Brad. Keep us up. Of course, of course. Thanks so much, <laughs> Yahoo Finance's Zone, Josh Schaefer. We appreciate it. All right, guys, AI has a lot of benefits, but its importance in healthcare is growing. Companies are taking note of AI's generative potential, especially when it comes to drug discovery. The French multinational pharmaceutical and healthcare company Sanofi is full steam ahead when it comes to using AI to innovate. Yahoo Finance's very own Anjali Kemlani spoke to Sanofi CEO Paul Hudson today. AI is not a bubble, right? I think we know that, and is changing everything, and much of it for the better. And so, you know, for us, for example, we just took a step back and said, if we go end to end on the value chain, where can we really lean in and do some very important sort of disruptive work? You know, develop, discovering, developing and, and bringing to market medicines is a complex and, uh, you know, challenging process. And if we, can, if we can improve the probability of success all the way from selecting, you know, targets to making sure that we can uh, deliver broad clinical programs to support that with evidence. We should try and do it more efficiently and, dare I say it, faster, because if we can, of course, we're getting medicines to patients who perhaps need them, and particularly in areas of unmet need. That's right. I know that that's an area where the industry is already using AI and already using machine learning. Uh, break that down for me, though, because it, it does require, especially with more complex therapies coming out, it does require a little bit more learning. So how does that work in terms of scaling up, uh, you know, of course, the timeline, but then uh, scaling down maybe in some other areas? What, you know, it, it's going to take some time before these machine, machines really know what you need. Yeah, look, it's a great comment. I mean, maybe take a step back. The way I look at it and the way we're approaching it at Sanofi, there's effectively two types of AI. I'm going to oversimplify it. One is, you know, sort of expert AI, handcrafted, you know, huge data sets, uh, significant computing power to try and model things that are, you know, incredibly uh, theoretical at the beginning to try and design uh, medicines to attach to targets. You know, these are these are a small number of highly skilled people with um, massive ML or machine learning tool benches, if you like, to be able to deploy the full range of thinking to try and uh, increase our likelihood of success. Right at the other end, we call it snackable AI, and I, you know, it's an expression we're using, which is really the day-to-day -day use of AI for people who want to be nudged into better decision intelligence. And you know, we want to be the first at-scale AI uh, pharmaceutical company, and I, and I think we've started it very well. Well, give us some examples of where you've rolled that out, because obviously we know there's the easy part, which is, you know, getting it to do the day to day tasks like, like you just mentioned. What about in the drug discovery process? Are you already using it for your pipeline? And give us an example of where, if so. 
Well, look, you know, we've developed the pipeline so quickly. In the four years, at least, that I've been here, we've increased the number of targets by more than 50% of uh, medicines that will uh, go into humans for the first time and beyond. And we've made massive progress, uh, you know, whether it's COPD, whether it's asthma, atopic dermatitis, hemophilia A. And, you know, we're proud of the advances that we've made. But the real excitement is in some of our early collaborations. We work with some of the best AI companies um, in, you know, uh, formulating designs of molecules, um, how to drug the undruggable. Um, we partner with Accenture, Adamwise, in silico, for example, who really are, if you like, discovery, computational discovery organizations where we work together on targets to try and bring the best of outside and develop the best inside to get there. And we're hoping um, we haven't taken the medicine end to end with AI yet, but it'll probably come um, over the next decade. But we think we've started very well. And it's very important, these collaborations, because we don't know everything internally, right? And so we're able to take on things we never thought were possible before. And that's that's pretty exciting for us. Going back to the pipeline itself, you do, uh, of course, we know the news today about um, the Alexi Alexion acquisition, you know, that portfolio from Pfizer. Meanwhile, you also have had many other types of drugs that you've developed. You've, you're even in the vaccine business, which you've already seen um, AI work with very well. So are there particular areas that you see, you know, AI more prominent for reducing that timeline than others? I know, of course, there's also gene therapy in the works, you know, and, and really targeted uh, sort of drugs. So I just wonder how all that plays out. Yeah, look, and this is the real magic of what's going on. We talked, touched a little bit on drug discovery. If you move to drug development, for example, it can be as simple as, you know, should we open more sites to do to recruit more patients? Should we recruit more patients at certain sites? You know, it sounds subtle, but you really have to do a lot of very sophisticated uh, algorithmic work to give you those suggestions. And if you get those things right, maybe you can uh, operate a study in a quarter, two quarters, perhaps even six or 12 months ahead of what you could do uh, before you're having those tools. And that means, of course, you can submit it, submit it to the regulators earlier and, of course, then get it to patients earlier. And I think we have to be very open-minded about that. Then, of course, in parallel, whether you mentioned gene therapy, but whether it's different yields and different ways of engineering capsids, you can you can really start to think about where can we think you know much bigger with a bigger data set to guarantee more success in terms of the manufacturing process. And, and then that follows us all the way through to how we supply and do we have the right medicines in the right quantities in the right places at the right time so that no patient goes without. You know, this we're really entering a, a new era I mean, the last point as well is we talk a lot about AI. Many people have read a lot about generative AI over the last sort of three, six months. Our opportunity to do things with large language models and with open large language models now is so significant. We're moving beyond the lab and beyond, if you like, data to be able to look at the, the, the written word. And we can now start to summarize and synthesize insights across our business um, from text and from um, you know our archives to make us much more effective. We never had these tools before. As even with Excel, for example, you just couldn't do this. And we're going to the next level on that. And it's, it's really exciting, frankly. It's a great time to be a CEO and to reinvent uh, the organization, reinvent my own role, for example. Thanks to the CEO of Sanofi there. Well, we want to bring in Anjali Kamlani, who was just speaking with the CEO. And Anjali, let's talk about more broad picture, right? When we talk about AI, its impact on drug development. Yes, Sanofi really expanding and going all in on AI. But it's something that's been around the industry for a while. It certainly has. And that's why it's really interesting, sort of the stance that Sanofi is taking. Of course, the company is now competing with all of these smaller startups that are in biotech that is solely focused 
on the utilization of AI. So it's really on big pharma uh, to really pick up the pace in how frequently they use it, how much they're going to be using it, and what the benefits are. The market already is in the billions of dollars for AI use in drug discovery. And now, as you heard uh, Paul say, they need to now sort of plan out the, the entire pipeline development as a process. So not just figuring out the initial molecule that works, but then beyond that, how do you then run some of the tests maybe, you know, preclinical to get more information? How do you start gathering those insights and utilize generative AI to produce that, you know, to the point of, I joked uh, with him at the end that, you know, Microsoft Office and Excel skills might be obsolete and whoever thought that day would come. So getting to that point where it's reliable and they're able to use it uh, should be part of that growth process. And it's interesting to see how many more companies are sort of coming out and already owning up to the utilization of AI versus those who have just had it sort of under the radar for quite some time. And we're talking about a market that could be 7 billion or more uh, by 2030. So really, really interesting uh, for that for that end. Yeah, certainly pretty incredible when you think about how it is already in the future here to further revolutionize the industry. All right, Anjali Kamlani, thanks. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. Have you tried pickleball yet? I have not tried pickleball. I can't move left to right. My knees are shot from too many years of playing soccer and skateboarding. So I can't do pickle, but I can play plenty of golf. Plenty of golf. All right. Well, I'll meet you out there then. We'll have a great deal of time there. The dollar recently resuming its March higher, something that we've seen steadily over the last couple of months. Months Now it was sent higher amid a global economic fears and exactly what that looks like, some of the disparity that we've seen across the world. Now we want to bring Yahoo Finance's Ines Frey to discuss a little bit more about those moves that we see. Ines, today we're seeing a little bit relief, but still not too far from those high levels. Yeah, that's right, Shauna. And I want to show you a bit of the trajectory of the U.S. dollar, the Dixie. This is against a basket of currencies. It's just below 105. But we look, we saw last year, about a year ago, we saw the dollar at multi-decade highs. You'll remember that equities were falling at the time. And then it went down. And back in July, this past July, if I pull up a year-to-date chart, you can see that it went down to 99. Well, over the last nine weeks, it has 
really been a rallying, a big move, and some analysts are saying that it's due for a bit of a breather. It's time for a pause. Now, why has it been going up? Well, investors are betting that the Fed may keep rates higher for longer. The U.S. has shown economic resiliency when it compared to, for example, Europe's underperformance or China's economic concerns there. And what does this mean, though, for U.S. multinationals? Well, a strong dollar is not great for companies that provide services and goods abroad because their products are more expensive compared to the local currencies, not as competitive. And we've seen that Apple and Disney, for example, have warned of these headwinds. Apple sells iPhones all over the world. Disney has its theme parks around the world. Now, last year, Credit Suisse put out an analysis that said that for every 8 to 10 percent jump in the dollar, that roughly translates to about 1 percent drop in profits for U.S. companies. Now, what this rally has shown you also is that despite a lot of talk about de-dollarization, BRICS countries getting together uh, to put in a different reserve currency, well, look, there is still a large demand around the world for U.S. dollars. The problem is, is that if you do see the dollar spiking too much, that tends to cause problems around the world because a lot of debt around the world is in dollars, guys. And Inez, while we have you, what can you tell us about the dollar, the Japanese yen, and why that's an important correlation to look at here? Yeah, it's important because it kind of shows you the divergence between what the U.S. has doing, been doing, and the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan. Because take a look. This is a year-to-date chart of the Japanese yen, up 12% year-to-date. That's a big move for one of the major currencies in the world, those major currencies being the dollar, the yen, uh, the euro. And what is, what this is telling you is that Japan has been continuing on with an easing monetary policy. Remember, they have yield cur- curve control. So they have been doing that uh, to help to save their bond market, basically. But they have also been feeling inflationary pressures as well. So they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because if they don't tighten monetary policy the way the U.S. has been doing, this impacts their currency. And we're seeing it. All right. Excellent stuff and analysis there. Inez Ferre, Yahoo Finance Zone. Thanks so much, Inez. Thank you. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market side. Stay tuned. Well, 
An unlikely winner of a worker well-being survey out this morning, Love's Travel Stops Country Stores scored 83 out of 100 in the first ever survey from the job site Indeed. Millions of anonymous employees were reviewed to rate U.S. companies based on happiness, stress, and satisfaction. Some other companies that ranked H&R Block at number two, Delta Airlines that came in at number three, and a host of other uh, companies that our viewers recognize, TCS, Accenture, even if you go into like, you know, the six through 10, IBM, Nike also rounding out the top 10 there. Um, and when you think about what really would go into a survey like this, as well as the, the, I mean, the scoring system is a little bit off here, I guess, because some of these should be tied for fourth. But uh, I'll kind of leave my golfer scoring system aside here and just focus in on what is perhaps making employees happy right now. And there are a few things. It's probably more flexibility, especially in this day and age, on what can give you more balance. Is there more of a virtual employee? Is there more of a hybrid workplace uh, that you can find yourself in? I don't know if that's necessarily the case that loves travel stops and country stores but for whatever they're doing they're doing it right H&R Block about the same case there and for two companies that I interface with a lot Delta and Nike um, you hear that through some of the employees how they feel represented how they hear heard, feel heard by the executives at the company too um, and how that advances the mission more broadly yeah, and to that point when you take a look at Delta there 86 percent approve of their CEO at Bastion's performance and when we talk about leadership the importance of potentially having some sort of mentor at your position, whether that's a CEO, whether that's your direct manager, obviously that's so critical just in terms of the day-to-day -day satisfaction, but you also want to know that there's a growth opportunity at that company. Speaking of Delta, I was a little bit surprised given the yep. fact that the airlines are having such a tough time getting the workers that they need. We talked time and time again how some of the morale at these airlines are low. Delta was the only one here within the top 20 of this survey and coming in at number three. Another thing that stuck out to me, some of these tech giants, which have historically been known as or thought of as the best places to work, yeah. not many of them were in the top 20. You mentioned IBM there at number six. Microsoft was the next big tech company at number 15. Apple was at 20. So some slipping there a little bit when we talk about maybe the perks and everything that are offered. I don't know. Mm. We've got to figure out. What's going on there? Bring back the free lunches. Bringing back the free lunches. But I agree with you. <laughs> Flexibility is so important yeah. when you talk about uh, employee satisfaction. All right, we want to do a quick check of the markets here. Just about 90 minutes into the trading day. We're looking at a mixed picture. The Dow up 170 points. NASDAQ just below the flat line as investors look ahead to the Fed decision in just about three hours from now. That's all for us today. Rochelle Okufo has you for the next hour. Stay tuned.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Kufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. Expecting a hawkish hold. The Fed is widely expected to hold steady on rates at today's meeting, but the focus will be on those quarterly rate projections, known as the dot plot. We'll cross all that action coming up this hour. And could Clavio be the surprise winner from the last week's IPO boom? Instacart down after popping on its debut on Tuesday and chip designer Arm facing downside pressure again. Plus, the UAW's so-called historic strike is expected to heat up later this week, with the union threatening to up the ante and hit more plants. So what's the spillover impact? We're across the possible fallout coming up this hour. But first, let's check in on the major indices this hour. Looking at a mixed picture, it's been really hyper-oscillating at the moment. We're seeing the Dow now just slightly to the downside by about nine points. The S&P 500, the only one in the green at the moment, but ever so slightly, barely up by about two and a half points. Taking a look at the tech-heavy Nasdaq, they're also under a bit of pressure as markets draw their collective breath ahead of that FOMC decision. With that in mind, let's also check in on the action we're seeing with the Treasury market as well. Looking at the five-year, under some pressure here, down about 1%. The 10-year, as you can see, they're also down about 0.8%. And the longest-term 30-year yields, that's down about half a percent on the day so far. Well, of course, all eyes are on Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve. Traders are expecting the Fed to hold interest rates steady. Now, the meeting follows a spike in energy prices, which could complicate the Fed's inflation battle. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schoenberger has those details. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, good morning, Rochelle. Yeah, you know, the Fed is widely expected, as you said, to hold interest rates steady this afternoon. And many economists expect that they will pencil in one more rate hike for later this year. And the reason for that is they really want optionality, right? Whether they decide to pull the trigger or not in November, they don't want to be painted into a corner. The Fed is deathly afraid of repeating what happened in the 1970s, which is that they thought inflation was on a downward trajectory only to see it go right back up. And the last thing the Fed wants is to have to jack rates back up because inflation is not under control and plunge this economy into a deep recession. So that's one part. The second part is we're going to watch for how many rate cuts do they see next year. Uh, Last, uh, we got rate projections from them in June. They were expecting 100 basis points of rate cuts. Will they keep that or will we see fewer rate cuts essentially signaling higher for longer. We'll have to see. Certainly a lot of people knew that, that the Fed was a little too late out of the gate when it, come, when it came to really recognizing inflation wasn't transitory. Now they're concerned about them doing too much. So we'll have to see if they yeah. can strike that balance this afternoon. Thanks so much. Jennifer Schomberger there for us. Meanwhile, the lack of homes for sale and the Federal Reserve's determination to bring down inflation by using high interest rates, well, those forces are coming to a head in the housing market. Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero joins us with more on this. Danny, what are you watching? Hi, Rochelle. Well, the U.S. is dealing with a housing affordability issue. There is recent data that really highlights the issue at hand. Builders are facing a dilemma right now that if they build a home, they most likely will have to help that buyer afford that home, given the fact that mortgage rates are hovering over that 7 percent or hold back. But if they hold back, then that prolongs the issue of supply and inventory that the housing market needs. And data out on Tuesday really highlights the slowdown in home building. Housing starts fell over 11 percent in August, driven by the drop in multifamily units, that's condos, apartments. But single family starts also fell too. This aligns with another survey out this week on Monday that really showed a very sour sentiment around home builders. Home builders are are losing some of their steam, their confidence and enthusiasm that they had earlier this year. And home prices are rising. We have to add that to the equation as well. So that's further squeezing the affordability problem right now. What is this signal? Higher mortgage rates is not only taking a toll on home builder confidence, but also consumer demand. So what's the solution here? Well, more supply. But if builders are skittish about rates and affordability, then that will further cause an imbalance in the supply, which we definitely need in the U.S. Rochelle. So then, Danny, with that in mind, KB Home reports earnings after the bell. What are the key takeaways that you're going to be looking for? 
KB Home is a home builder that thrives off of build to order strategy. And in this third quarter results, one of the big prime highlights that I'm hoping to hear a lot from is the buyer demand. In the second quarter, KB Home focused on entry level buyers. Is that happening this year, this quarter, or was there a little bit of a shift? Also, incentive perks. We've heard across all the home builders about some of the incentives they've been offering, such as mortgage rate buy, buy downs to really boost some of the sales. Is that what happened this quarter? And cancellation rate. This goes hand in hand with buyer demand. Um, are buyers getting cold feet? We've been hearing a little bit of that in the resale market that there's been some pullback. And then finally, to round out everything is the outlook. Is the company going to increase their housing starts or are they going to be going through their backlog? That will really signal how this home builder is really hoping to end the year. Is it with a bang or is there some softness ahead? Rochelle? Certainly a very different time when buyers were sort of hand over fist, waving, waving all contingencies at the peak of uh, COVID. And, and now look at where we are now. So it'd be interesting to take a close look at that outlook. Appreciate you as always, our very own Danny Romero. Well, we're counting down to this afternoon's Fed decision, but with expectations of a pause, much of investor focus is on what Chair Jay Powell will say about the November meeting and the market risks that come with it. For more on what to expect from Powell and the Fed today, let's welcome John McLean, Brandywine Global Portfolio Manager. Good to have you on the show here, one of the coolest names in finance. I'm quite jealous. Um, so I want to ask you, though, because a lot of investors, they're really pricing in a pause for this meeting. Is there any chance, though, that the Fed could surprise at the moment? I don't think the Fed is going to surprise in terms of hiking this meeting. I think where the surprise may be felt is in the dot plots and the revision upward, as we expect, uh, to those dots, meaning higher for longer. Um, I think, you know, really the, the market is uh, far too sanguine uh, about a further hike, we think probably happens in, in November or December. The expectation is about 30 percent right now. And then really the number of cuts being priced into the market uh, at this time, about three in 2024. I think that's going to come down after Powell speaks. And so, John, with that in mind, uh, being that they've really priced in a pause at the moment, then what do you see as the biggest risks for the market right now, especially since we are a long, a long way away from November in terms of a lot of the data that's still going to come out between now and then? Well, the biggest risk for the market at this point is uh, really inflation coming back because uh, good news is bad news uh, for the market in terms of inflation. So, you know, the stronger the economy is, the longer the economy kind of, uh, you know, keeps trucking along here. Uh, the more ammo that gives the Fed uh, to hike further. And look, you know, I, I think eventually we're going to have a recession. We've had an inverted yield curve for an extended period of time. Um, and, and the viciousness, really, of this hiking cycle will eventually create a slowdown. But uh, we need to see asset prices come down meaningfully uh, to get the consumer to stop spending. So, really, uh, at this point, the biggest risk is uh, inflation creeping back up in the back half of the year. And obviously, you have the, the Magnificent Seven, which has really been driving a lot of the, the gains that we've seen so far this year. Do you think a lot of that focus, and as we've sort of seen that progress sort of spread throughout the broader markets, how much of that is going to perhaps change at some point? Are we going to be due for a correction? Well, look, you, you haven't had a strong breath in, in the market. You have had seven companies, um, and a lot of that's driven on, on AI. A lot of that's driven on China relations. Um, so if either one of those things starts to cool a bit, uh, you, you will see a meaningful pullback. And I think really what we're saying is when you look at equities, they're, they're priced for perfection at this point in time. You're trading at a 20 times P.E., uh, with T-bills well north of 5%. So you've got the earning earnings yield on the S&P 500 well below where uh, T-bills are. And, and that's typically not what we see in this market. And what do you think that markets should be pricing in at the moment? When you look at some of these recession risks ahead, depending on what the Fed does, if, if they do decide to hike again, hike again in November versus, say, just stay the course and stay data dependent and let the medicine take its course. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a tale of two different marketplaces. When we look at uh, investment grade and high yield uh, corporates uh, with spreads reasonably tight, that, that still actually makes sense to us because we think companies have, uh, you know, dynamically changed over the past decade and really don't face uh, 
uh, particularly in the higher uh, credit part of the marketplace, don't don't face meaningful default risk. Um, while interest costs are going up, that's fine uh, for these companies. It just really creates a lack of free cash flow that goes to equity holders through dividends or share buybacks. Now, the equity market uh, uh, is certainly a little bit different here. I mean, I think it's, it, it, like we said, it's pricing in a soft landing, and it's really ignoring the fact that the cost of capital has gone up by four or 500 basis points for, for companies over the past 18 months, and that management teams' capital allocation policies are really focusing more on debt repayment and living within interest coverage ratios as opposed to uh, shareholder-friendly activity. So we see uh, the equity markets as being uh, particularly overvalued in the U.S. And John, in terms of the questions that your clients have for you regarding sort of the Fed's next moves and really how to, to manage their portfolios and allocate in this sort of environment, what, how are you advising them? What, what's really standing out to you? Well, I think the obvious place to be is in credit at this point, given uh, we're kind of in the seventh inning stretch of, I, I think, heading towards a, a recession over time. Higher, higher interest rate expenses, I said before, pays lenders to the expense of equity holders for, for the foreseeable future. So we're saying to clients, hey, look, if you're thinking about a traditional 60-40 portfolio, that, that probably needs to flip uh, more to credit exposure at this point because we're back to getting paid uh, yields uh, across fixed income that are at 15-year highs. Uh, this is a very attractive time for, for clients to be repositioning away from equities, which you think are reasonably frothy, into fixed income marketplaces. And John, of course, looking internationally, especially as we think about the pressure that we've seen with the dollar as well, anything overseas in the international markets, obviously, China is still a bit of an unknown in terms of its recovery picture at the moment, though seeing some sort of green shoots, especially when it comes to the consumer. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, what we're paying attention to in China is policy response, and you're certainly starting to see it. But I, I think that it's um, not enough at this point, and we're going to have to see more uh, policy adjustments um, from the PBSC. And so we, we see downside risk to China, generically speaking. And then in terms of Europe, um, you know, still, still a bit of a, a mixed bag there. And just quickly, I want to ask you, because we have seen quite a bit of divergence between central banks in, the, in their efforts to tackle inflation. Usually when we see, especially the Reserve Bank of Australia, that tends to sort of plot where we might see the U.S. Fed go. But when you have a divergence like this, what are some of the signals that you find most helpful when you're trying to figure out what perhaps our Fed might do next? Well, you know, it's tricky, right? There's too much noise in the market, and you really got to focus on what matters. And what matters is the Fed's dual mandate, which is... Uh, unemployment and price stability. And so when you have CPI trending lower, yes, but still meaningfully above where uh, their long-term target is, and then you've got unemployment, yes, it's a lagging indicator, but still near the lows here. Uh, really, I think that the mindset for uh, the, the Fed is pretty simple because you, you kind of face with two doors. Door number one is threading the needle, which is ex extremely difficult to do. Uh, you know, I think pausing to engineer a soft landing could be disastrous if inflation reemerges into a slowing economy. Or door number two, which I think is more logical, which is uh, you're going to create an economic slowdown with tight monetary policy, which can then easily be corrected with loose monetary policy. So to us, you know, we're pulling it down to the Fed's dual mandate and we're ignoring a lot of the noise in the market. And the Fed certainly has been holding steady to that dual mandate and ignoring all the calls to, you know, perhaps have a 3% inflation target. As Jay Powell already said, that's not happening. Great having you on with your insights. John McLean there, Brandywine Global Portfolio Manager. Thank you so much. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Make, make sense out of what's happening in China for us. And are we getting any more clarity that we need on the markets front? So China is stimulating its economy. A lot of people think they are not, but they clearly are doing it. But it takes time, and I think that China is not in the policy that we did, like a big reopening and trying to stimulate it through free checks and say, let's go and spend a lot of money. Chinese consumers are different. They're also very cautious because what happened during extensive lockdowns, they're wary. But there is some change, and I think that this is about China being very gradual in its approach, knowing it can reach its goal for 5.5% goal uh, growth. It may not happen this year, however, it may be something for next year.
The United Auto Workers strike is now entering its fifth day and no signs of a breakthrough in negotiations are in sight. But there may be a light at the end of the tunnel, with Ford of Canada and Unifor reaching a new tentative labour contract to cover unionised employees. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Price Subramanian to break this down for us. Hey, Price. Hey, Rachel, yes, yeah, some good news here, potentially, you know, Ford can, like you mentioned, struck a labor contract with Unifor, which is the union that represents Canadian Ford workers. Uh, the union and Canada, ham uh, Ford Canada ham hammered out the deal, excuse me, uh, 24 hours after the original strike uh, deadline had passed there in Canada, not, that's this Canada strike, not our strike. Um, and the two sides apparently working for the last, last six weeks. Uh, we don't know much about the deal yet, but uh, the union members need to ratify the deal, so they don't want to kind of give away some of the, the sort of ins and outs. But uh, we're hearing that Automotive News is reporting that the uh, the union got uh, wages, wage hikes of over 20%. So that is a kind of a good starting point there for striking workers here in the States. Kind of a, a precedent is set, and maybe that's where they can start going from, from a wages point of view, and then hopefully into the benefits and other things like that. And it's interesting because that strike in, in Canada would have been a total walkout versus the strategic one in the U.S. But perhaps there is a possibility that the strikes in the U.S. could expand now and the effects could be widespread, right? Yeah, you know, the union, the UAW here in the States, uh, Sean Fain talking about how if substantial progress has not been made uh, by Friday at noon here, uh, more workers will be called on to strike. Um, you know, we haven't seen... They're not saying where they'll actually strike, what new plants will actually be hit, but you know they could expand to other factories. It could actually expand the strikes at the current factories that they're at right now, potentially. So for instance, at Ford, the Michigan assembly plant in, in, in Detroit, only part of the plant is on strike. So we might see more of that there. So for their part, the automakers say that they are negotiating. They're, they haven't walked away from the table. But as you mentioned, the ripple effects have, have already occurred. We're seeing German auto giant uh, uh, ZF uh, laying off workers in Michigan because of the, of the, of the fillover effects. Uh, you a steel might idle a, a steel furnace in Illinois uh, for, for risk mitigation purposes. So that's happening there. And meanwhile, uh, Barclays, uh, the investment bank, saying that if this break expands, the union may target the big truck plants, which are huge money makers for the big three. So that could seem to be more pain for them uh, potentially by Friday, if, like I said, if substantial progress has not been made. Goodness, and it still seems quite contentious at this point. So I know you'll be keeping a close eye on that for us. Appreciate you, Prost of Romania, in there for us. Thank you. Now, as the Fed readies yet another rate decision amid its battle to tame inflation, investors ponder the next steps for their portfolio. As dominance in the Magnificent Seven stocks and their impact on major indices has waned throughout the year and fixed income ETF appeal continues to grow, investors are looking out for strategies to stay on top of such an uncertain market. As part of our ETF report, sponsored by Invesco QQQ, let's bring in Vetify Vice Chairman Tom Lydon to get his insights on how you can be investing and getting the most out of this uncertainty. Good to have you back on the show here. So, so help us break this down in terms of the, the flows that you're seeing in terms of ETFs versus some of these, these equity markets. What, is the, what are the, the data telling us? Yeah, great to be here, Rochelle. I, I'll tell you, usually you see about one fifth of the money flowing into fixed income ETFs versus equity ETFs. But this year it's been almost 50-50. And part of that is as we're surveying financial advisors all the time, most feel that a year from now, rates will be lower than they are today, that the Fed has applied its medicine, will probably have some type of recession, albeit a soft landing. But as we know, the Fed acts quickly in times of recession. It's not 25 basis points every couple of months. They'll come in with a hatchet and start slashing rates to a great degree. And even though today they're six point two trillion dollars in money market funds getting about five percent when rates cut that yield is going to be cut dramatically and they don't want to be stuck on the sidelines they'd rather be longer duration so areas like corporate credit even high yield as one of your earlier guests pointed out those yields are pretty attractive these days and we're starting to see more and more money go into corporate credit high yield etfs with the idea that if they can lock those rates in for a longer period of time and if they can be there during the period when rates get cut, they're not only getting the yield, but they're getting some appreciation as well. So, Tom, with that in mind, then walk us through some of your top picks for ETFs at the moment. Well, a couple things we've stepped aside from the Magnificent Seven because people are, are scared of the volatility and the pricing. But if you look at RSP, the Invesco 
S&P 500 equal weight ETF, that's a one five hundredth allocation to each of the 500 stocks. So you don't have that huge overweighting in just 10 or seven stocks. That's also important. The, the IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF, the valuations in the small caps today are cheap compared to large cap. You know, you can get uh, a PE of 10 as, a, as opposed to a T, PE of 20 in the S&P 500. But some of the alternatives that we've also seen have been covered call strategies. One of the most popular has been the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income which is JEPI, J-E-P-I. The, the yield there is almost 1% a month, 1% a month while you're actually waiting for the markets to recover. A complementary strategy is a Global X NASDAQ 100, also 11.7% yield right now, where you're getting an, a, a stupendous yield and you're also hedging your equity positions too. So those have been some of the standouts, along with quality stocks. The final one is the iShares Quality Factor, Q-U-A-L ETF. Almost $10 billion have gone into that ETF so far this year. So the word is diversify outside the cap-weighted S&P 500 because that's where the value is and that's where the diversification is. And Tom, I want to ask you about active versus passive ETFs because some people, A, might not understand the difference and they might not really understand the flows that are going into them at the moment. Where is that money flowing? Well, you're right, Rochelle. E ETFs were built on the back of indexes uh, 30 years ago, S&P 500, the Russell 2000, the Dow Jones Industrials. Uh, however, new ETFs have come out that have actually had active strategies. But still today, only 4% of the $7 trillion in ETFs is in active strategies. However, just last month, there was more money that went into active strategies than passive index-based strategies and for the reasons we've kind of touched on. If you're going to buy fixed income, you don't want to buy an index because guess what? Some of those corporations may have debt that may be subject to default or uh, might be downgraded. So dancing around the different issues is going to be important for active strategies. And then as far as equities are concerned, buying companies that uh, may be a big part of indexes, but might be too volatile, might be too expensive, active managers can come in and not only select what they feel are the right companies, but also the right weighting for their certain portfolio within that ETF strategy. So active is surely back where we had about 10 years coming out of the financial crisis where it was all passive strategies. The pendulum has swung and we're seeing more and more active managers come and offer their mutual fund active strategies in an ETF form. It, it's about more choice. Well, it's definitely, definitely important. Do your due diligence and of course, know your risk as you're looking at some of these ETF selections. Appreciate you joining me this morning. Better Five Vice Chairman, Tom Lydon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. All right, let's do a check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. Still looking at a mixed picture here, although the Dow currently close to session highs, up about 180 points or about half a percent on the day. The S&P 500 also in the green. We're seeing real estate driving that growth at the moment. Communication services and tech, the laggards there. And of course, with tech in mind as the laggards, tech heavy Nasdaq there, down about a third of a percent or about 40 points as markets draw their collective breath as they await that Fed interest rate decision. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
As we await the Fed decision, what can we expect the markets to do after the decision comes out? Let's go to Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickery to break that down for us. Hey, Jared. Hey there, Rochelle. Um, just looking at the uh, Wi-Fi Interactive here, let's put it back. Uh, we do have, we had a little FOMC drift earlier in the day, uh, but here I want to show this. This is what's happening to the stock market on and around Fed meetings. This goes all the way back to 2018 when uh, Chair Powell became Chair Powell. And uh, what's happened this morning, this is a pre-Fed gap. So if you were to only invest in the mornings and overnight session prior to Fed day, you can see it drifts up just like the FOMC drift. Um, and indeed it was up last night. And then this orange line here is a Fed day till until 2 p.m. But you see things get volatile and pretty dicey when we look at these other metrics. Fed day after 2 p.m., this red line Line here took a south, uh, southward trip during last year's repricing of risk when we had all those meetings where the market got surprised, higher for longer became the mantra. Uh, but we've flatlined in 2023 for the most part, haven't seen too much movement over the last few meetings. And then the day after, uh, we've also kind of flatlined. If nothing, we've gone up a little net 2023. So all in all, I do think we're going to see some fireworks today, but I'm not too concerned unless we see a huge reaction to the downside, which indicates that market participants were caught flat footed. Now, I want to check out the uh, interest rate market. I'm going to show you the entire uh, yield curve because all of this looks pretty si uh, similar here. Here we have the 13 week T bill. This is a uh, year to date. Uh, let's not call it 25%. Uh, we're going to measure it's up basically over five percentage points from zero. That's where we had liftoff from last year. But it doesn't look like it's rolling over, does it? Neither does the 30 year, neither does the 10 year. It's up, up and away. And then the five year similar story. Um, I think it looks like the yield curve is poised to go higher here. Um, if that happens, then we could see that repricing of risk. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So let's check out some heat maps and check out what's happening today and the sectors. Uh, as Rochelle has been talking about, as you have been talking about, Rochelle, communication services and tech, those are the two worst off. Those house several mega caps. Energy giving, well, it was giving back gains from uh, yesterday, but it's now climbed into the green. And let's just take a look at the NASDAQ 100 so we can see the bifurcation within the mega caps. Actually, now everything is in the red. We, were, we started out the day with some of these in the green, but now Apple down 1%, Alphabet down 2%. So we'll have to see how all of this tracks throughout the FOMC meeting. If rates, if rates go higher, that's going to be a big draw in the mega caps, which have so far sustained the markets this year. We'll certainly be keeping track of that. Appreciate you, as always, our very own Jared Blickery there. Shifting gears now to thousands of protesters in New York who took to the streets calling for the U.S. to do more to combat climate change. Now, Climate Week is one of the largest annual events focused on global warming, bringing leaders from government, business, academia and the nonprofit sector for speeches and panels. But is it all talk or will there actually be any action? For more on this, David Calloway, Calloway Climate Insights founder and editor-in-chief, is joining me this morning. Good to have you on the show here. So from what you've seen so far at the, at the summit, it. Is it a sense of more of the same? I, I don't think it's more of the same. I think this is this is the year that Climate Week really comes into its own as the preeminent annual spot on the calendar for climate activities. Which the um, um, Climate Week ten years ago was really very small compared to UN General Assembly Week in September, when when world leaders would gather each year in the UN. The Clinton Global Initiatives were at their full strength back then. But over the last 10 years, and indeed the last three or four years in particular, Climate Week has really grown. And it's become everything that the climate summits annually, the COP summits, uh, have not become. Um, for instance, you said the protesters, 20,000, 30,000 protesters, uh, on Sunday, you know, protesters weren't allowed to gather in Egypt last year for COP27. It's doubtful they'll be allowed to gather in Dubai this year for COP28 in uh, early December. Um, world leaders, uh, the world, the climate can, uh, calendar COP has been taken over by oil interests, for, interest, uh, for instance. No sign of oil interests at the UN's big climate ambition summit this morning, uh, which is going on, where 34 world leaders have been asked to speak, but only the leaders who have made significant contributions. And, and that's a really fascinating thing. So today is the key day of Climate Week. Uh, and I think you know, this is going to be the time when Climate Week is, is seen as jumping past 
the COP summits that uh, that have been dominating for 30 years and have been so fruitless in trying to uh, to help the, the world move uh, at the attack the climate emergency. And David, I have to ask you about some of the, the, the no-shows here, especially when you, when you think about China and its contribution, not just to, to obviously to emissions and, and global warming, but also to the efforts. And when you think of the commitments that it made with the Paris Accord here, how important is that to really not have the, the leaders there having that voice uh, involved here? You know, it's, it's very important. And, and the leaders in China and Russia, for instance, have not shown up at the COP summits in a couple of years. Either India is not speaking today. President Biden is not speaking today. He spoke yesterday, for instance. But uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres has only invited the leaders who he feels are actually making significant headway uh, against uh, against climate change. So, for instance, Justin Trudeau from Canada, leaders from the EU, even California's governor Gavin Newsom is being asked to speak, but no one from India. China didn't show. Yeah, Russia obviously didn't show. Even more interesting, France and the UK didn't show. And that um, that indicates uh, some really troubling undercurrents going on, particularly in the UK, um, moving away from earlier climate commitments. And to that point, as we do hop across the pond to the UK, uh, today UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak plans to weaken some of the key targets in the country's efforts to slow climate change. Now, one appears to be delaying a ban on the sale of new gas and diesel only car and diesel only cars to 2035. Now, the previous deadline was 2030. So, can you tell us what this means for us? I mean, obviously, these were some non-binding agreements that they made, but then to see the UK pulling back on this, what what reaction should we have to it? It's really disturbing. It was only three years ago that the UK held one of the COP climate summits in Glasgow and, and former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, a conservative, made all of these commitments. Uh, now his, his successor, Rishi Sunak, is turning against them. And it's it's really all political. Uh, conservatives, the Tories are, are falling in the polls. Uh, it's looking like Labour may be competitive in the election at the end of next year. Uh, and so they're trying to think of strategies that can help. One of those strategies is to lower energy costs, right? And energy costs have been leaping across Europe and the UK since Russia invaded Ukraine last year. So he's going to go back on his on their green pledges. It started in July when he allowed oil drilling to resume in the North Sea. And now we're seeing this week he's essentially not scrapping them, but just pushing them all back. Um, which obviously from an environmental standpoint, an academic climate standpoint, is a disaster. We're already way behind in trying to meet our climate goals to keep uh, uh, temperatures from getting too high. It's been the worst year ever for climate disasters. So to see a politician, a leader of a country like the UK, actually make a political move like this solely for ratings and votes um, and against kind of the the better interest of the world, it's incredibly disturbing and, and very ominous for our own U.S. election, I think, next year. The, the Republicans will be watching this closely because reducing energy costs is a very populist measure, and uh, some voters are going to like it, and so it, it will work in some cases. So, you know, it's one of the reasons I think we'll see climate begin to rise to a, a level of priority in the U.S. election that we haven't seen in past ones. And David, in terms of how corporate America is prioritizing its efforts with, with climate and how it's really factoring into the bottom lines, as you do see these more extreme weather events, are we finally at a tipping point where it is being prioritized? Or is, it, or is that can still being kicked down the road? It's really a good point. The, uh, um, the politicians are playing games with climate change. Most of the corporations are not. Obviously, you've got your oil and gas interests that are in favor of kicking the can down the road. Um, but most of the corporations, uh, um, the, the Fortune 500, for example, are moving ahead with climate policies. Climate risk is risk. It's business risk. And CEOs understand that. Investors understand that. Analysts understand that. Um, these businesses have to hedge against climate disasters uh, that can affect any part of their business from agriculture to insurance, uh, you know, to hospitality, as we've seen, to transportation. Uh, so corporates, despite what's happening in politics and how troubling it is, 
the corporates are moving forward with uh, uh, so-called ESG strategies, no matter how unpopular the moniker has become. And as you mentioned there, it's, it's still risk at the end of the day, which is something businesses can't ignore. So I appreciate you so much, David Calloway, Calloway Climate Insights founder and editor-in-chief. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. The first new nuclear reactor in seven years began operations in Georgia back in July. And while a new survey from Pew Research Center found that Americans still favor solar power and wind power over nuclear, building power plants to produce nuclear energy is steadily gaining in popularity. In fact, 57% of Americans are now in favor of more nuclear power plants compared to 43% back in 2020, with support increasing among both major political parties. The Lightbridge Corporation focuses on building new state of the art fuel technology to make nuclear power plants safer, more efficient, and more economic. And with focus shifting to using more sustainable energy practices, the company is seeing more interest. With that in mind, let's bring in Lightbridge Corporation CEO Seth Gray to discuss this more. Good to have you on the show here, Seth. So, talk about how this development is different from the traditional sort of nuclear fuel technology that people have been familiar with. Right, the fuels used in reactors are based on these pellets of uranium, a couple of hundred of them stacked inside a metal tube. And it, it's been that way for about 60 years with slight tweaks to the technology. So Lightbridge has reimagined how to design nuclear fuel, fuel from scratch using modern technology, modern metallurgy, using a very different approach so that we could redesigned fuel that makes it run a thousand degrees Celsius, about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit cooler in the reactor than the current fuels do in the exact same reactor while producing even more power, making the reactor even safer. 
be even more non-proliferative, better able to go up and down in power to work with renewables on a zero carbon grid. And we're partnering with Idaho National Laboratory, which is owned by the U.S. Department of Energy, to test the fuel and roll it out commercially. And we're, we're making tremendous progress. And, you know, as your polling shows, there's um, tremendous support for new nuclear power. And that's partly for climate reasons. It's partly for energy security reasons. So uh, we and allies don't rely on Putin for fossil fuels. And I do want to ask you, because as much support as people may have for the for the fuel itself, for the nuclear fuel technology, in terms of where it actually gets built, it's one of those things that people like the idea of it, as long as it's not in, in their backyard being built somewhere. How do you get over those, those concerns that people have about where some of this infrastructure will end up going? Yeah, well, well first of all, some of the new smaller reactors will be what's called behind the meter where they'll be at industrial facilities like oil refineries, data centers, or government facilities like military bases, and take them off grid so that even if someone attacks the electric grid, brings down the electric grid, we don't lose those emergency facilities. Nuclear has what's called an energy density of about a million to one advantage over anything else of just how much energy you make from the amount of material. So you don't need a lot of reactors. A lot of people see a lot of wind and solar and hardly ever see a nuclear reactor and think that there's more power from wind and solar than there is from nuclear. But there's not because each reactor makes so much power. So you could put these plants not near where people live, but outside the cities, And the newer, smaller plants are being designed to be so safe that we expect the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will license some of them to operate um, without needing an emergency planning zone, even across the street from the site, that everything will be contained within, even in the very unlikely event that something goes wrong, you know, it could never hurt anybody. And we have to talk about the size of this industry. I mean, I mean, by some estimations, a $25 billion global market for this sort of fuel here. Who are the front runners here? Well, for Lightbridge, one of the great advantages we have is that there are hundreds of existing reactors in the world that could switch to using our fuel. So we'll be targeting them first. Those are the front runners. And then we expect the new, more large reactors that are being built, like the one that you mentioned at the beginning of the segment can use the fuel. But then as we switch to these smaller reactors, there are many of those that could use our fuel too and bring real advancements, real improved economics and safety. And we think those smaller reactors faster to build Uh, Many of them can be built largely in factories and shipped to sites like building a 737 aircraft in factory by the thousands, ultimately. So so we we, we see first the existing reactors then moving on toward the smaller reactors that will ultimately be largely factory built. And it's interesting because some of the ways that nuclear fuel technology is presented, it's almost as if it's a, a transitory solution while sort of the, the infrastructure and the other things needed for, say, wind and solar and water really get up to pace to meet the demand here. Is that how we should be viewing it? Or is nuclear fuel technology supposed to, supposed to be that, that end all that's actually going to make some of the others more irrelevant? Well, I think we'll always need a diversified energy mix with different sources that we use for our energy. And there are benefits of doing that. And there's certainly some places where renewables renewables make sense, where hydro makes sense. But nuclear is going to be necessary. We're going to need to have massive growth in nuclear power within a diversified energy mix because nuclear is what's called baseload power. It's there at full power 24-7, 365. If the wind isn't blowing, if the sun isn't shining, If there's been droughts and the hydroelectric dam isn't operating at full power, like we're seeing now with the Hoover Dam, for example, nuclear is there. Even in severe storms in Texas, nuclear got the state through that. So nuclear is just going to be part of the mix in a growing way if we're going to meet climate and energy security goals. And the new technologies like what Lightbridge is developing are really going to help nuclear meet those goals. 
And I mean, we are still continuing to push towards a cleaner future. I mean, when you look at the growth of the EV space as well, but then you also have, when it comes to, to nuclear, people wondering about sort of the energy intensive process when it comes to perhaps mining, milling, and enriching the, the uranium in the first place in order to get this clean energy, energy. So when people are trying to balance out, you know, clean versus green and making it sort of worth the inputs that perhaps might damage the climate in the process, how do you square that? Oh, nuclear is more than a 98% uh, reduction in CO2 emissions versus a coal life cycle from mining uranium through handling the used fuel that comes out of the reactors. Uh, again, with this more than a million to one amount of energy that you get per, per unit of uh, fuel material that you need. So yes, you mine uranium but you mine very little. I mean, something the size of a soda can is uh, the amount of nuclear fuel material you need to provide all of the energy used in a lifetime of somebody in the United States. That's it. That tiny amount of mined material versus massive amounts of fossil fuel. There's just no comparison. And same for the concrete pores for building the facilities, the steel, you know, uh, it, it's so little compared to the massive energy that that plant will produce. So nuclear um, is uh, probably overall just the most reliable, best way to decarbonize. And when you use batteries, when you use renewables, you have a lot of mined rare earths and other materials from China, from other countries that aren't very friendly to us. So it's not just CO2 from mining, but it's also really pushing us into reliance on countries for our energy that maybe we don't want to rely on. And that, that's an incredible visual there, the side of, size of a soda can for the lifetime of power that someone in the US would need. Fascinating stuff there. Appreciate you joining me this morning. Lightbridge Corporation CEO, Seth Gray, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, well, more color on Goldman Sachs' awaited sale of specialty lender Green Sky came last night from the Wall Street Journal. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith to give us those details. Hey, David. Hey, Rochelle. So uh, this is a part of Goldman's larger push out of consumer lending. Um, and Goldman has said as far back as its investor day in February that it was uh, considering um, selling Green Sky. Um, now, from the Wall Street Journal story that came out last night, um, it appears that uh, the sale for Green Sky is sort of at its uh, final innings, uh, with the bidding, according to the, the journal, uh, including KKR and PIMCO, as well as San Francisco uh, headquartered 6th Street, which currently holds the leading bid. Now, the deal is expected to be valued at $500 million, uh, which is approximately 71% less than the one, $1 billion seven, or excuse me, $1.73 billion that Goldman paid for Green Sky in the first quarter of 2022. So that was an all-stock tran uh, transaction. And the possible sale of Green Sky, uh, obviously, has been something that is kind of seen as like the biggest uh, step that uh, Goldman needs to take to sort of, you know, finish this uh, sort of tricky pull uh, pull out of uh, consumer lending that it announced as early as the fourth quarter of last year. Um, but, you know, this is obviously something that we're paying a lot of attention to. Uh, last week at a Barclays conference, um, CEO David Solomon uh, did not have a ton to add on uh, the Green, Green Sky uh, deal. And he said that uh, the bank would report more once the, the transaction is closed, but that they have been market in the marketing process to sell Green Sky. Um, and obviously, just to hit on the strategy overall, um, the remaining uh, consumer finance products that Goldman has, they're still trying to bring those uh, to profitability. And since 2020, um, the bank has lost about $4 billion on uh, consumer lending or consumer finance products, excuse me. So, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a tricky thing that uh, a lot of investors are waiting to see uh, to be ended. And David, I know that you've also been paying attention to the deposit story at small banks. Now, they've regained about half of what they lost since SVB failed, but the mix is different. Can you break that down for us? 
Yeah. So, uh, the, you know, a really good thing is that uh, small banks or those outside of uh, the 25 largest in the country have regained uh, the most deposits uh, they've had since uh, SVB's collapse. Um, so that's very good. And it's kind of opposite of what we saw in the first quarter um, in the beginning of the second, which was that it looked like most deposits were sort of uh, fleeing to larger banks and sort of a flight to safety. Um, and now what we've seen is that uh, banks have been paying overall and across the industry uh, more on their rates to depositors to retain customers. And obviously that cuts into profitability. Um, and sort of the most extreme example of this is brokered deposits. And brokered deposits are almost exclusively focused on uh, rate payments for prices. There's a third party that sort of matches uh, a rate seeking or a high rate seeking depositor with a bank for a price. So there's not really as much of a relationship built in. Um, and this was addressed by the FDIC's uh, chairman, uh, Martin Grunberg, earlier this month. Um, and he did point out that uh, broker deposits do present liquidity risks for banks. Um, it's a lot harder to rely on those funds uh, when, when uh, a bank might be cash strapped or needing to uh, quickly repay financial obligations. Um, but that being said, uh, broker broker deposits do kind of get a bad rap. Um, you know, they're seen as, as much better than uh, a bank borrowing from uh, the U.S. government in some capacity. Um, and, you know, it really also depends on which bank you're looking at. Um, but the change in the last year has been pretty significant. We've seen about an 86 percent uh, increase in broker deposits across the industry. Now that means that still uh, broker broker deposits make up a pretty small amount of total deposits in the banking system, only about 6.5%. Um, but at certain banks, and uh, Martin Grun Grunberg uh, also pointed this out, um, it can vary a lot. Um, and you know we're looking at certain smaller banks uh, such as uh, Comerica. Uh, as well as uh, Western Alliance and uh, customers banks, all, all of having, um, you know, pretty significantly high amounts of broker deposits. Now, again, this isn't really bad on its surface, but it, it, it does pose an issue in terms of liquidity. And it's something we're going to focus on a lot more as these banks try to uh, maintain profitability. I'll certainly be keeping track of that. Appreciate you breaking all of that down for us. Our very own David Hollerith. Thank you so much. Well, Clavio is set to make its debut today. The company pricing its IPO shares at $30 each. Now, that's above its targeted range of between $27 and $29. Now, the company, which specializes in marketing automation across email and SMS marketing, was founded back in 2012. It currently boasts more than 130,000 customers, turning a profit of $15 million in the first six months of 2023. Now, Yahoo Finance's Shauna Smith is speaking with the co-founder and CEO of Clavio later today. You can catch that chat and conversation in our 3 to 4 p.m. show, so you don't want to miss that. All right, well, let's get you a final check of the markets. As we can see here, still looking at a mixed picture, but the Dow here currently soaring at the moment, up more than 200 points this morning. The S&P 500 also up about nine points on the day, ever so slightly. Tech heavy Nasdaq, though, still being weighed on there, but ever so slightly down about 11 points on the day as we await that interest rate decision from the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell coming up this afternoon. All right, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Cooper. I'll be back with you at 11 a.m. Eastern. I'll see you then.